What's going on, guys? It's Friday. Thanks for tuning in to the J Squared Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Division Street Auto. You can find them at 595 Division Street in Pawtucket. Or give them a call at 401-723-7080 for all your automobile needs. Mention this ad that you heard it on the J Squared Podcast and receive 10% off. All the labor costs. Tonight we have a special guest. His name's Maurice Lohman. He is a marathon runner and a successful businessman. But it always hasn't been that way. He went through a lot of trial and, and error, trials and tribulations in his life uh, that a lot of people, to be quite frank, would use as an obstacle and, quite frankly, an excuse to give up. So we're going to hear his inspiring story of from the low part of his life and what turned him around and how he became uh, not only a person that has overcome, but has inspired some others. So we hope you enjoy everybody and thanks for tuning in. Time to talk some shit with the J Squared Podcast. Here we go. And yeah. All right, so we're live. So back to it. Guys, welcome. And, um, you know, Maurice, we were just kind of getting in, really just shooting the shit real quick. But so where we, you left off, you, you did some speaking at some schools. So, yeah, I've had... um. What's up, everybody? Happy Friday. Just really excited to be here and to be chatting. Welcome, uh, welcome. With uh, Josh and Jay here, Jay, too. Um, once, I, my passion is to reach the youth because I feel that where I started making devastating bad decisions was right at that junior high, senior, junior, junior year, senior year of high school. Right, okay? like 16 years oldish. Right. Drive. So, and, and, and I know, so for example, I, I throw it right out there. I know marijuana is a highly debatable subject. It's, it's accepted. There's a huge debate whether it can be. So where I'm going with this is marijuana is great for some people. Yeah. It is. Ben, there's medical benefits. There's um, the benefits of it can keep you away from hardcore drug use. Right. You know what I mean, a lot of guys will use marijuana mm. instead of cocaine or right. crack or heroin. And I think that's great. It's much better to smoke a joint every night than it is to shoot up in your arm every night, obviously. Um, I think we all agree on that. But with teenagers, I feel that they need to hear the bad results of, of marijuana use. So when I was in junior high, um, I was one of those kids that was like, I'll never do drugs. Right. I'll never do drugs. I'm Dr glad you said that because that's, that's where I wanted to know where it started. Drugs are for losers, um, including pot. So, I mean, I'm talking junior high. Like, there were some kids that smoked pot. And I was like not even thinking about what were you hard. into at that time? Like, so you weren't into the you know, academics, sports, you, acad sports on a level of like local CYO basketball, recreational, little, little, yeah, little league baseball. Gotcha. I was never like the all star. Gotcha. You know right, what I mean? Right. So gotcha. the, the kids that were athletes, I wasn't part of that crew. Right. But I was playing CYO basketball. I was at every little league baseball game. But I was just like I was a bench. Just guy, your yeah. average. I was your average teenager playing recreational sports. Loved the sports. Loved going to the playground on the weekend with my boys on bikes. You know what I mean? Riding BMX bikes, shooting hoops, baseball cards. I used to collect stamps. I used to collect coins. I went to rock shows. Like stuff, like cool so stuff. So you had a lot so, of interest. Oh, yeah. To keep your mind and busy, and to keep had, you occupied. Both of my parents were together. I come from a great family. Like, my parents didn't make a lot of money, but they, they gave us a good life. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, my Christmas list, I got what I asked for. Do you right. know what I mean? Like, I look back on those things and... Um, and Very out. fortunate. That's what I mean. I was extremely fortunate. Um, so, to touch on that, like, in junior high, I knew what marijuana was. Yeah. But I was, like, so against it. I was like, I'll never smoke. Like, right. I'm, I'm not going to do drugs. Um, high school comes around, and it was a little more prevalent like it was around more but mm. still 10th grade i was very very focused on academics like i liked being a straight a student i liked the fact that like i had a chance to take the sats at an early age like i i took pride in the fact that i was so you, one of the smartest i was yeah. one of the smartest kids in my class i mean it was public school you know what i mean but i took a lot of pride in that i i got excited over the academic part of it right you weren't just coasting through you, correct you took pride yeah in exactly going. like i knew that if i studied hard i was definitely getting an a can you scoot in just a, yeah. you know, a smidge um, just for the so yeah, hey, thank you i'd say now 
my father was very vocal about the fact that in high school you're going to get you're going to see different crowds of people. Absolutely, just to prepare you. Yes, for that. certain crowds are nothing but trouble. Some people that act like your friends aren't really your friends. Like that kind of like basic advice. Like do the right thing. Listen to your mom and dad. Say your prayers at night. Make sure you're studying. Like you know what I mean. I had a good upbringing, and where I'm going with that is, I never like to put the blame on other people or peer pressure or anything like that. But it's eleventh grade. See, you know what I mean. You're very impressionable. Very, right? Exactly. You start to see. You, you start to see cool kids. So now, I was, and like I said, I hate to try to put the blame on somebody else, but um, try to cut right to the point here. Took a driver's ed class in junior in the, my junior year of East Providence High. Driver's ed was was booked at East Providence High School. So me being like, I always thought I was like ahead of the curve. Like, you right. know what I mean? Like, I'm reading the newspaper at night. Other kids don't do that. You know what right, I mean? Right. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm like, so I found out that they were holding free driver's ed at the all-girl Catholic school up the street. And I'm like, what would be cooler than, you know, going to an all-girl <laughs> Catholic school and taking driver's ed? I'll be, right. the, I'll be the only sign, boy in sign the class. Me up right right? Sign me up, right? <laughs> So big, big joke. We tell. I, I'm at the playground the next day. I tell my buddy about it, and I'm like, "Well, we can't tell Corey because we don't want Corey to go, right? So we don't want my buddy to go. So it's like this on. So I, let me speed this up a little bit. So we sign up. We get to the all girl Catholic school. We literally are the only three boys in the class, right? Um, score, 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 exactly. <laughs> and and I have my eyes on on this on what I, who I think is the prettiest girl in the class, right? And I act like my smooth self teacher. that I yeah. think I am. And I, I get her phone number, and we start chatting and stuff. Um, the second day of, of driver's ed, this is how naive I was to drugs and to weed and to liquor and stuff like that. The second day of driver's ed class, the teacher comes in, and the room smelled like weed. Well, it wasn't me and my buddies, but the eyes were on us because we're the three public school kids, right? Right. So the teacher singles us out. He's like, this is bullshit. I'm not holding my class. This whole this whole classroom smells like marijuana. Who's been smoking? Like, he's swearing. His face is red. Yeah. He pulls us out of the classroom. You and, and your buddies. Me and my buddies. And we're literally like, it's not us. Yeah. But he doesn't believe us. He doesn't believe you. So he brings Just us back in and he's like, so, he's like, somebody needs to admit to who it was. So the two girls that me and my buddy had been exchanging numbers with the day before, mm -hmm. it was them. They admitted, oh, it was us. We're so sorry. So they get sent home. I'm trying to speed this up. No, um, do your thing. Just tell it like it is, man. Yeah, so that girl, the one I had my eyes on, we she asked me if I smoked. So I said, yeah. You didn't want to say no. I didn't want to say no. Be so, cool, I said, so I said, yeah. So she was like, all right, good. Friday night, we're oh, going out. Oh, man. Um, well, Friday night, we're going out, and we're going to smoke. So I'm thinking, all right, no big deal. I'm getting laid. Right, so I'm, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I work part time at um, Remember the Store, Paper Rama. It's it's their I their familiar, their yeah. I parties now, right? Okay. It used to be called Paper Rama. That was my first like part time retail job. I stocked yeah. shelves. I did cashier work. Um, she came to visit me, picked me up, her and her friend, and like so now I'm like I'm out with this pretty girl. Her friend has a nice car. We're going to get weed. We're going to the house where there's going to be more weed and some were you vodka. Nervous about I what was, you were do I when the was weed nervous. Came so, in? so we get to the house and there's a bong and then there's weed and there's papers, and I'm supposed to you act know, like you I, know, what the fuck's I don't going know on? What's going on? Like I literally like I knew <laughs> what, like, Can you roll I knew what weed and papers were. Like, like I knew yeah. the concept <laughs> and I knew what a bong was, but I'm li like I had ne I literally had never taken a hit of marijuana before. Right, right? hit the bong. So they just so like, yeah. <laughs> So okay. she passes the joint. I'm like, well, I don't think I should roll it, right? So someone else rolls it. They pass it. And I pretend I know what I'm doing. I can tell the other girl's like, he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, so, like yeah. <laughs> but now, now that opened the door of, I'm going to try this. Right. Uh, this is cool. Yeah. Like, this is were... cool. I'm going to try this. So not just that night. Yeah. I immediately, so now me and... I don't want to put the blame on those two girls, okay? Well, here, but now, on. let me interrupt yeah. you just a second. I don't. I I can respect what you're doing about not blaming them, but I think ultimately we have to realize that your, they your surroundings part. are surroundings. You know, right. like they 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 influence what you do. You know, it's like you you read um, inspirational quotes or articles all the time, and it says, "Hey, man, show me your choose, friends, yeah, and I'll show I'll you show your you. future." So maybe they didn't actually make the decision for you, but it, it plays a part. But yeah. Sorry, so continue. No, of course, and. But now it opened the door of, I'm going to try this. This is cool. So now me and my 
close friends, two of my close friends who hadn't tried uh, weed before. Now we're now we're smoking together. We, we now we know where to buy it. We we know a kid at we school that it, has man. it. We can get it. Um, senior year of high school, we're smoking every day. So wait, this oh, was in, oh, this was in. Did you guys score that night with these girls or what? Well, no. So I it oh, was just no. me with the two girls, and that ended. So that ended up being my girlfriend for okay. almost two years. And no, she, she's that's like, just another example no how women can mess up your life. <laughs> 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 um, but we'll get we'll get back to that. Just kidding, we'll ladies. Get, we'll get back to that. She. Um, All right. So you smoked. Everything was fine that night. You tried weed. Nothing. Yeah. Before. So like it wasn't like I think they made fun of me because they could tell I had never really smoked before, right. but I acted like I had and stuff. Um, we've all been there. Yeah. So now, so now senior year, I'm smoking every day. We're, we're buying, wow. we're buying dimes and twenties. And one of my buddies that old was, too, that yeah, swag exactly. Breaking now, sticks, what, dirt. Yeah, one of my buddies was like a year older than me. He had access to like, let me ask you, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what year is this? 1995 and 1996. So you're... Th- I'm 40 right now. 40 to throw the yeah. age out there. Like no, no, that's no, fine. Just, that's fine. Yeah, um, it's 26. <laughs> so... <laughs> last year. When but I, I look year. at that because that was a huge shift in the way that I, I looked at school, authority. Like, so I went Life. from... Yeah, I went from being one of those kids that was like, yes, An overachiever. Sir, yes, ma'am. You know, that's... Oh, thank you. Thank you. I can do extra credit. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Right. And now I'm like, oh, what do you mean I'm late? I'm... I'm not late. Like, um, leave me alone. Like, I became like defiant to authority. Right. Too cool for school. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I, s- looking back now, I'm able to see all that. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. I can. I saw teachers that cared about me pulling me to the side. Like, are you smoking mm. pot? But you didn't see it then. Then I was like, leave me alone. What do you mean? Yeah. I was then it's like, like, you know what I mean? You're not my father. You're exactly. Not my mother, like, you know what I mean? I was worried about having a fresh new polo sport shirt and looking cool and hanging out with the girls and you know what I mean? And the grades were still coming easy to me. I could show up 15 minutes late for class with, blood, right. with bloodshot eyes and smell like I just right. smoked a blunt in the car and, and still, still get good grades. Test. So that like kind of fed my ego and fed my defiance to yeah. the authority. Absolutely. Like, that's my get out of jail. Do you jail know what I mean? Like, I was like, I'm still smart. You got yeah, nothing right. on me. Do you know what I mean? And I, so what happened was my homeroom teacher got fed up with the fact that here I am walking into class five minutes late, smelling like weed, acting like it's no big deal. Um, and she sent me down to the principal's office and was like, Maurice loman has been smoking Every day, I can smell it on them. We need to do something about this. So they searched my locker, okay? My locker was being used by my buddy, whose jacket was in there. There was like three dime bags of weed in it. Now, remind, now remind you, it's 1996 at East Providence High School. Three yeah. dime bags of weed was a big it's deal. A big deal. Oh, you yeah. I mean? Today. So they called, the, they called the police. I wasn't 18, okay? My buddy was. When they went to his house, they found more than just the three dimes. They found wow. they found more weed. They found some other stuff. It actually made this huge news story. So it's like a because, domino effect right. that's happening. So now they suspended both of us. Not only did they suspend us, we were close to being expelled. So here I am, a senior year honor roll student. About to graduate. About to graduate, getting suspended for 60 days for possession of marijuana. They wanted oh, to set an example. Part of the year. They wanted to set an example for us to let other kids know you can't just come to school with weed, right? Right. Um, so we were both suspended for 60 days. I had to, they wanted me to get a lawyer and stuff. My parents couldn't afford it. I just went to the school committee and pled my case and told them, listen, I got mixed up with the wrong stuff. I'm not really a bad kid. So they let me get homeschooled by teachers that were willing to come, you know, teach me at the public library for those two months. I kept my grades up. I actually, they let me go across the stage, but I had to go to a summer school class in Providence for my English credit. Like it was a big mess. But back then at that age, I'm just, I'm like, I'm going, I'm rolling with the punches. Yeah. Sounds like you you really had uh, a lot of people that cared about you and wanted you to. Yeah. Well, my mom and dad were like, yeah. The railing kind of. Right. right. But and my mom and dad were like, there's no way you're not going to be a high school graduate. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like you're going to. So, and like, yeah. even the teachers were like, Maurice, you're too good of a kid. Like, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you? And they told, I had a lot of people I- intervene to be like, marijuana is a gateway drug. Marijuana is a gateway drug. You're not going to go to college if you stop smoking weed right now. Do you know what I mean? And to, to me, they were speaking a foreign language. Right. I was already smoking every day and still getting good grades, still showing up to work, still holding down a part-time job at the mm. supermarket. So you like a the functioning... Street. Yeah. But I, and I, of course, I wasn't a drug addict. I was only smoking weed. Like, in my mind, you know what I mean? Right. right. So, but that attitude, 
of entitlement and, and ego and all whatever words you want to come up with, invincibility, that carried on. So I barely graduated high school. As you can tell the story I just told, I, uh, they only let me walk across the stage because I pleaded myself to the school committee and everything. Did the summer school class, got my diploma in the mail, um, and I went from filling out all of my college applications to kind of like that stuff wasn't even on the radar. Right. Because now, You're now I'm worried. hanging out with guys that are selling a little bit of weed, selling a little bit of coke, selling a little bit of acid, a little bit of mushrooms. I'm I'm interested in all that. Yeah, it's all brand quick, it's all brand money, new to me. I fun. had a cousin who was pretty immersed in the cocaine selling game, okay, at the time. I had never seen cocaine in real life, only on the movies, okay? Right. He introduced me to it and literally showed me a pretty decent amount, showed me how to bag it up, told me not to use it because you're not going to make any money. Like He's like, you know, but who does that? Right. You don't give somebody a new drug and say, don't try this. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. And I wasn't, I mean, half of me is this hustler, business-minded guy like, yeah, let's make some money. Now, mind you, I grew up in the suburbs with both my parents. I didn't need to be a drug dealer. This isn't a story of like right. me have, wanting to feed my family. Do you right, know what right, I mean? right. Like I didn't need to be a drug dealer. This was I like thought the, I was cool. Well, yeah, it's like that. That that uh, is it allure? You yeah, like the it, allure. Just, uh, that so, image of being that cool young hip right. guy, nice making money. So nice now, clothes. now I'm working at the supermarket. I'm working for the city of East Providence. I have two good jobs as an 18, 19 year old high school graduate. I got two solid jobs. And now I'm getting introduced to cocaine selling, okay? The money was literally flowing in. I went, um, I think we're, I think I'm a couple years off. I don't think I got introduced to the coke until about 19, 20 years old, okay? Right. But I'm already out and about at like bars and stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not 21, I'm already out and about at bars and stuff. Got the connection. And I kind of took a lot, not kind of, I like took pride mm -hmm. in the fact that I was the guy that you looked to if you wanted a $40 bag of Coke. Right. There was a rush. There was a thrill. The money was coming in. I was able to pay my cousin every Friday and get more. I did that for a good, I'd say, between 6 and 12 months where I told myself, I'll never touch this stuff. I actually remember seeing the way people would act. Right. I had a buddy that he like ran a construction crew or something. Him and his crew would get together on Friday, pool all their money together. They'd buy a large amount of Coke. And um, hours later, they'd call me back and they'd want more. And I used to tell myself, that's never going to be me. Like, right. I, I would never do that. Like, how can you be so crazy about a drug? Mm. Well, guess what? I don't know. It's like something told me I, want, I needed to try it, okay? So I took one of my $40 bags out one day, tried it by myself, locked in a bathroom at a, at a girlfriend's house, and was instantly, and I'm not, there's no exaggeration to this. Instantly hooked. Wow. Instantly hooked. The taste, the feeling, the rush, the immediate need for like a cigarette and a shot of liquor, um, the kind of like it, just the endorphins, the increased sexual appetite, everything that you read about and hear about, like it was just all happening at once. And I was like, this is so badass. And I'm like, I'm so bad. Like, you know what I mean? I was hooked. I was instantly hooked. Because right and, now it's all positive things. There's no negative. Oh, yeah, there was no negative. I was like, it was off the, I just felt off the wall good. You right. know what I mean? And um, I hid it from everybody. All right. In my mind, cocaine wasn't a drug that like you walked into a room and say, hey, guess what? I'm high on coke. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I was kind of like hiding it from the girl that I was dating, hiding it from my close friends. You were very covert friends. about yeah. the whole... hiding it from my close friends. Um, started going back to those houses where I was selling to, and those guys that used to say, hey, hang out for a little while, and I used to say, no way, now I'm hanging out with them for a little while. Blowing a couple lines. Now that $300 transaction is a $150 transaction because I'm just sitting there sharing it with them. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Now my... All this extra money that's coming in from the cocaine sales, it's barely covering my habit. I'm literally my number one customer. I'm waking up in well, the morning. I'm waking up in the morning. Say that. That, you know what I mean? So I, and I, I say that all the time. I became my number one customer immediately. And it was like I was now I'm trying to sell drugs just to keep up with the fact that I have a vicious drug habit. Right. How long so, did that happen? Like, I know you say immediately hooked, but are you talking I tried cocaine and then within days I was doing well, within, all the time. within days, I was doing it daily, but a $40 bag a day. 
But then that immediately turned to 80 bucks to, hey, let's do a $100 bag. Hey, oh. let's invite a few more people over. Oh, remember, so I mean, it just, it always, always, always graduated more um, elevated, but whatever the correct word is. And at that point, I would say things like, well, I would never do anything worse than this. Do you know what I mean? This is as bad as it's going to get. I'm doing a little bit. I'm partying a little hard. Right. I'm, so I would never do anything worse like, than this. Whatever. I'm getting a little high. Right. A few lines. Nothing. But everybody's getting a little high. Right. So yeah, no big deal. Everybody. Does you're that. rationalizing. Yeah. It. yeah. That's that's a perfect word for then it. Then I landed my first sales job. Um, so let's back let's back up a little bit. Yeah. As as I'm really struggling with the cocaine and everything, um, I wasn't. I didn't see myself struggling because I was so functional. Right. I had the two jobs still and everything. Going to work, still. Um, I had put off my four-year college plans because I had a son. That was the excuse that I used. My son was born. I need right. to spend time with him. That's why I'm not pursuing. It's my incredible four-year. how we always find a way to rationalize right. mistakes everything. that we're making. You know, so, bad decisions. We know they're bad, but we're saying, "Well, this is why I'm doing it." You know, it's. it's I had acceptance letters from Salve, from Providence College, I believe, Rhode Island College, URI. And I just, those things weren't on my radar. I was this cool wow. guy that was out hustling the streets, meeting new people at the bar. Yeah, I'm the guy that you can call for coke. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I got weed. I can get you more weed. You need more weed? I can get you acid. I can get you more. Like, I took so much pride in that. swag in Yeah, that. I was like, I thought I was so cool. I'm buying new sneakers. I'm getting the haircut every weekend. Could you be know? because we look at, you know, when, you, when you're in that position, is, is it because like the, you feel like you're wanted by these people, almost like, you know, like Pete, like you're needed by everybody. Like you got yeah, the attention. Yeah, I felt you feel I, like you have the a lot affirmation, of the attention. Um, I managed to get myself enrolled in a one-year computer tech program at the school that's car. It's now out of business, the Catherine Gibbs School. And this is while you were doing the cocaine, like right. Okay. So, um, full-time student now, paying my tuition, working two part-time jobs to help pay for the tuition. Really trying to keep my head on straight and make something out of this one year program. You're trying to burn the candle at both ends, almost seems yeah. like. <laughs> and but I remember like going into the bathroom because some of this is a blur to me because my my drug use ends up getting very like it it gets a lot more severe over the years. So I'm trying to piece all this together. I remember going into the bathroom at school to sniff lines just to stay awake to, during class because I'd been up all night. Drinking, sniffing, smoking weed, that kind of stuff. So, like, I was, I was a cokehead. I yeah. was the guy that you were like, Maurice has a coke, a coke problem. problem. What are you gonna like? Do you know what I mean? But it's, once again, lied to my girlfriend, lied to my parents, lied to everybody about this. Okay. Um, hard, how, how hard was that? Did anybody, you know, like in that time frame, did anybody like suspect it or make accusations? Did you ever have to lie to somebody's face and say, "No, I don't do coke"? So my girlfriend at that time lied to her all the time. Because right. she would, she would suspect stuff. Um, money starts missing. Time that the time that you spend pursuing these endeavors, whether it's mm. uh, selling, shortens or, or buying, yeah. like you're always you're it's always like, doing are something you? you're not supposed to be doing. Right. Well, Why did your boss call? Your boss called me wanting to know where you were, mm. or somebody came by here from your job looking for you. So you you didn't go to work today. So it's like it's oh it was always something. Well, what do you mean you didn't get paid? Like that, that doesn't sound normal. Did, right. But you know what I mean? Like, right. and, and in my mind, it's like, oh, the checks didn't come in today. And I believe it. Why right. wouldn't everybody else believe it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's a joke to think that like that, but that's how an addict's mind works. You're always justifying it. So I managed to graduate, um, Catherine Gibbs from, from this, from the Catherine Gibbs school landed a great job at, um, at a bank immediately. My only responsibility was to do PowerPoint, Microsoft PowerPoint administration very, very easy for someone that just graduated a, a one-year computer tech This school. is insane. So it's still, not only are you, like, you're, you're an addict at this point, you know, yep. you're a hardcore addict, but you're not only just functioning, you're still excelling. Excelling. You know, so, you're still progressing. But, but the drugs forward. were such a, a hindrance. So listen, I land this job, okay? And now, hindsight, I look back and I remember the guys that had that gung-ho attitude that, Hey, I can't believe I just got a job for the bank. Like, what can I do to be better? Can I stay late? Can I work on Saturdays? Like, I remember those guys and thinking, like, these guys are crazy, right? And here I am falling asleep at my desk, getting pulled into the office. And my story was, my son was keeping me up last night, right? Which was a lie. Right. My son didn't live with me. He lived with his mom and her parents, okay? But I have a son and I'm 20 years old and I'm, I'm just 
that's my excuse. Yeah, yeah, like, you like know a what I mean? Safety net oh, my son was keeping me up last night. That's why I can't stay awake. I'm so sorry. I'm going to do better. I was really up all night partying and chasing drugs, and that's why I couldn't perform the next day. Um, so I got fired from that job after a few months. They just couldn't tolerate it anymore. But I had that attitude of, who cares? Let me go get the next one. Mm. Walked into a car dealership, got hired on the spot because of my attitude and my ability to run Talk. my mouth. And that fast-paced environment and that fast-paced money was a bad combination with, with my addiction. Yeah. So now, not only, am I now, not only am I hustling on the street, I'm hustling at work. Made and that money. fast money, I mean, I was pretty successful to be in that, to be that age and to make that kind of money, like I made like, I believe 90 grand in my first 12 to 14 months wow. just from hustling Toyotas. That's huge money. We're talking 1998, yeah. to the year 2000. So that was big money. Yeah. But I had nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it, but some fancy shoes, shirts and ties, maybe a little Toyota Camry that I paid for, and then a vicious drug habit. You know what I mean? So it started to get tiring. You know what I mean? I would see guys buying brand new vehicles, taking their families on vacation, talking about buying an investment property. And I was just never there. Like, and you're making the same amount as um, Exactly. Yes. But drugs was always my number one priority. And it got wow. to, it was just so, so severe. The cocaine use was just, it was just, it hindered me like beyond, beyond description. Okay. I it was, consumed you. It did. It did for years. But still. So Toyota led to another opportunity at a Lexus dealership. Okay. Where I actually excelled for a very short period of time and then got fired due to, due to, due to failing a drug test. Um, so once again, I went from Toyota to Lexus getting fired. My attitude was, I'll go get another job. And right. I did. But it was the same thing. Do right. the right thing for six months. Do the right thing for 12 months. When you say months. do the right thing, you well, mean at work? Did you stop doing coke? or No. So, the right. coke so you never, were just following the rules so, of work. So yeah, to kind of to kind of backtrack a little bit. In my early... So now, the car dealerships brought me through like my, my, my early 20s. I knew I had a drug problem. Right. I knew it. And I knew that I needed help. I walked into a clinic, a, a Kodak clinic. In How old were you at this point? Probably 23, 24, right yeah. around there. Maybe a couple years before that, a year or two before that. Walked in and just said, hey, I need help. I'm, I have a drug problem. Um, so I, I had health coverage at the time. No yeah. problem. Fill out the paperwork. I don't, I don't want to blow through this quick because I'm, I'm curious about yep. that. But did was there a specific thing that led you to go and, and walk into that clinic? Did something happen, whether it's with you know your girlfriend at the time, your son, a family member, like it's the job? Or the feeling of having an awesome week of, of earning. And then waking up on a Monday morning with nothing. So it was a negative feeling. It, was, it wasn't yeah, like a was, motivational thing. It was yeah, like, a, it was like fuck, what are you doing? How, we, how are you going to stop this? Like I was literally blowing 1300 bucks in, in three days Just, and not having anything to show for it. Wow. And then not, not even having enough to pay back the, the drug dealers that I was dealing with. So now I got people looking for me. When so I you're was making to, boatloads of money, but you're in debt. To your drug to, Yes, to, to the coke, to the weed, to the liquor. And my attitude was like, I was like, I used to act like, like part of, part of the allure to the, to the, to the, to the addiction and to the drug selling game was like me being able to, to, to show up at a party and be like, oh, drinks on me. I'm the guy. Coke on me. Yeah. I'm the guy. Yeah. You know, you don't right. got to pay for that. Come on. I'm you know what man. I mean? Like, no, you, you need an extra 40 bag? No problem. Pay that's, me, pay me any, next week. And that's kind of almost, I don't want to say every, but like most young men. You know, that's, that's an, insp like you you inspire to be that guy. So, you want to be the man. Yeah. And but, now, so, so where, and I had, and to fast forward a little bit, like when I listen to like the music and stuff these days, like that's all that's glorified so, yeah, is right. the drugs, the money, the jewelry, the sex. Being the go-to right. guy, being the king. You're the plug. You're the, you yeah. know what I mean? You're the man. Right. Right. You know, you're going to shut down the club right. when you show up because right. everybody wants to see you. You know what I mean? You're spending money. In it. And there's so much attention on that. I didn't even have that. Like I, I, I can't blame the hip hop music I listened to right. as to why I became a drug dealer. That's that's not the case. I right. just I followed the wrong paths, got influenced by gotcha. the wrong people. Um, Go back to the Kodak though. So I, I walk into Kodak. And I just wasn't ready to take it serious. They signed me up. They invited me to a group meeting. I'd go to the group meetings. I would talk about my problem. Um, but I wasn't ready to kick the habit. I I can remember getting high in the bathroom there once. Okay. I can remember being afraid to, to do the, the piss test because I knew I was going to fail. Mm. Um, I can remember blowing off. Did you fail? Did, did you ever? 
Yeah. So they when they yeah. give you the on the spot test, I, I knew I would never test clean yeah. because I, I hadn't stopped using. Right. Okay. It wasn't enough for me. Going to a weekly meeting, going to see a counselor once a week, it wasn't enough for me to want to kick the habit. That's I was right. admitting that I needed help, but I wasn't ready to, to kick it yet. Um, as all of this is going on, I started getting in trouble with the law. Little things. Driving without a registration. Not paying my child support on time and missing a court date. Having to serve 30 days in jail. You would think for most 21-year-old men, 22-year-old men, you spend 30 or 60 days in jail, you lose your phone, you lose whatever. Back then we had pages before the first cell phones mm -hmm. came out. But you lose things, you know what I mean? Your freedoms, you, pretty you, much. Hey, like, what, right, not just your freedoms, but like your life isn't the same when you get out. If you do 30 or 60 days in jail, your you, job's yeah. not there, your girlfriend's probably not there, your family can't believe you screwed up again. Do you right. know what I mean? So None how, of that stuff, it, it wasn't ask, enough. How, how did that... that so going and doing a 30-day, because I'm assuming when you're in jail, you weren't able to access Coke. You Correct. You get Coke, right? Correct. Did you come out and think, all right, well, I don't need this anymore? Like, how did that happen? There was, when I was at the, when I was younger and just doing those 30 days, 60 days, because it happened numerous times, mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to get clean. I wasn't so looking at the, back out I'd come back away. out and right away I'm looking to like when I can be smoking and drinking again, when I can pick up some more Coke. So all the way through my 20s, Dude, I you, I'm sorry, I don't, no, I don't no, want to no. interrupt you. I'm just curious because you, you say, you know, like um, when you smoking and drinking in the coat, did they really go hand in hand? Like did, were you as, um, did you feel the same need and, and requirements to get drunk and get high off weed as you did for the coke? Like, so overnight? when I was an everyday pot smoker and I, stu and, and, I, and I drank a lot too, when I did that line of coke in the bathroom that day, it gave me that rush. That that exceeded everything. That was my number one priority. I didn't I didn't think of weed it just as like getting blew high your anymore. mind. Yeah, I didn't think of weed as getting high anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of liquor as getting buzzed anymore. I thought I could drink the whole bottle if I did a few lines. Do you know what I mean? Right, and so right. the coke was always top priority as far as drug of choice um, and what fueled my addiction. As I got older and still was having problems being um, a cocaine addict, I used to tell myself, well, at least it's not crack. I would never smoke crack. I would never so do So again, heroin. rationalizing. Rationalizing. Again. You know, I mean, I might party a little bit too hard or, you know what I mean? But it's it's coke. People do that, don't they? Mm -hmm. Like, that, that's that's what I'm saying to myself. Um, and, I, and I actually didn't know what crack cocaine was. I had only heard, like, horror stories and the... And the stuff you see on TV, crack kills and, you know, crack e epidemic ruining the neighborhoods right. and stuff. Like, I, I had a little bit of knowledge, mm -hmm. but no firsthand experience. I, right. Um, then I was introduced to it. This okay. was after a few 30-day uh, benders? Oh, this or? was after a couple times in jail. Yeah. This was so after it's safe my to say that, what, for a couple years, you kind of just repeated this cycle repeated of... Repeated the cycle. Coke, and now new job, lose the job. Right. Go, and right. my parents were always there to help me. My parents would... Wow. I would, I would go back to them and say, I'm so sorry. I screwed up. My girlfriend kicked me out. I, got, I lost my job, but I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to get back on track. I just need a few months. And they'd let me stay with them again for of a few course. months. You know what I mean? So my your, parents... You're a father. Yeah. So my be. parents would always be there for me. Maurice, you're better than this. You're better than this. You're so smart. You're so handsome. You're so ambitious. You're, the drugs are ruining your life. You're wasting your life. Like, it's not like my parents didn't care. It's not like they weren't there with compassion. It's not right. like they weren't there with guidance. They were there. You just needed you just to weren't listening. Own, I man. just wasn't listening. Do you know what I mean? I mean, my father smacked me around about it. My mom would be so upset and so disappointed because she would see all of my potential just going out the window. I mean, who screws up? A chance at a, at a Lexus dealership at 23 years old. Yeah, Some right. Guys, making buku bucks. That's and, what I mean. Doing and I love cars. That's yeah, one of my passions. Before that, like just blowing off college. You know that, like that, that's, yeah, exactly. Like you had most, a lot. Of, so I had, you had a, a lot of opportunity. I had a lot of opportunity. There's kids today that would do anything for a, a chance at a four year university. Oh yeah. And I had that chance, and I just blew it off. It wasn't like it was nothing to me. Um, and once. So I was still trying to be a drug dealer. You know what I mean? So how old are you right now? Like at this moment, you moved back home a couple times. And Mid-20s. So getting, okay. getting over that mid-20s hump. So I'm 26, 27, yeah. 28. So this has been going on now for about oh, five years. Oh, yeah. Five, over six that. Years. Six, seven years. I can say that I struggled with powder cocaine for seven or eight years. Honestly, That's a long off and time, on. time. And the man. longest I would ever stay clean would be a few months. 
Right. One, of my, one of my buddies who's a, who's right. a close friend today, yeah, either jail yeah. time or just literally like being so bummed out from getting fired again that I was like, I need to stay away from that stuff. Um, oh, wow. So you, you were able to just... Yeah, inside, okay. I would. I could, but it was like always in the back of my head. And it was always probably because there was no financial means to get back up and running. Right. For, you when, know what I you mean? you get fired, the money stops. Exactly. Now okay. when it went, my, And I have a friend that used to say, Maurice, you have a problem. He's like, you get fired? And then you go get a better job to make more money to buy more drugs. Like, it doesn't make any right. sense. Like, you, why, don't counterproductive. You, why don't you go get a job that pays you, like, next to nothing so you can't afford <laughs> to get high? Okay? Just, okay. Yeah. Right? Um, Not the worst way to look at I it. Would, I would brush myself off and go get a better job and make more money. And now I have more money to buy more drugs. And it, was, it wasn't good for me. Um, so, I don't want to get off track. So, the point is, I was introduced to crack cocaine. Okay? This was at what age? Mid twenties, so twenty six, okay. maybe twenty seven. I was a mortgage broker at the time, okay, and this was when the mortgage business was hot. So there was a lot of money to be made. A lot of money, okay. We were making big commission checks every Friday. We were drink two thousand five, six. Yup, right around there. We were drinking and we was and we were sniffing. Yeah. My buddy took me to um to a, a crack house in South Providence one night, and I I'll never forget this because they were so excited to see him. And I had never been in an environment like this. Now, I had been in some shady places before mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But I had never been in a house that was all for crack. So the only people in this house were either using or selling crack. That's it. Okay. It was an actual just crack Yeah. House. And so we're there. And I remember they were so excited to see him because they knew when he showed up, he's spending money. He, wow. He, he's the mortgage broker. He's the guy. He's, he's here to party, right? Yeah. So they were excited to see him. And he was doing the crack. But I didn't really have any interest. Like, I had a little bit of Coke on me. I had yeah. my liquor. I had a little weed. It wasn't your thing uh, yeah. at the time. And I didn't thing. really know, like... And, and you um, probably have, a ne- like, a negative perception of it. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not a crackhead. Right, but it was almost like I was kind of, like, still kind of naive to the fact, gotcha. to what was going on. He would let me try, like, the... They call it a chaser, like, what was ever left in the pipe. But that never did anything for me. Like, I didn't right. get high or hooked or anything like that. But now my mind's working, okay? Now I'm thinking... I always have Coke. I can probably make my own crack and try it out. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I did a little like experimentation. I put oh, some so Coke. Oh, so you did it on your own. It oh, wasn't like yeah. somebody said, here's some crack. No. Try it. So I went and figured out how to do it on my own. Like I took some Coke, added some baking soda, some water. I like, you know what I mean? And I just. Wow. Now I tried my first hit of crack on my own. Okay. What was that like? And it was. It blew me away. The, the It was everything that the Coke did times a thousand, times a million. But for some reason, I thought I could manage it better, right? I'm like, oh, this is like way more manageable, okay? But right. which is a joke. Obviously, it's a joke. It's not reality. And I started using crack on a daily basis. Now I know. Was that, you, now how I long know, did that transition take? Rather quickly? Or? Very quickly. Very quickly. And I knew a few people that used it now. So now I'm like, I'm telling them I can get it. So now I'm selling it to keep up with it. And it was the same, same thing. Same cycle. Just right? a new drug. But the sell, I didn't have many crack customers, okay? I became the guy that just, I consumed so much of it. Consumed so much of it. But I had, the, I had a job. Like what crackhead has a job? Right. That's the way I look at it. So I I used to You're tell my I used to tell like, myself I'm, I'm not okay. a crackhead. I'm not a dog. I'm not that bad. Interject yeah. for just oh, one course. second, and, and I want to find that you know like your story is actually very unique in the sense that you're very self aware. Like you oh, know, yeah, I know that I'm messing up. What you're, yeah, yeah, I know. You, you know that you you know you're so, doing this thing and functioning. Yeah. So like for example, but like so bad things would happen to me that would usually scare a normal person away from this path. And it didn't scare me. All I'm right. talking like getting chased by the state police and throwing the crack pipe to the ground and right. hiding in the bushes for 15 minutes until you don't see lights anymore. It didn't stop me from going back out and, and wanting to get high. Yeah. Okay. Um, losing everything, getting kicked out from a girlfriend's house, not having a place to live. Um, none of that stuff set me straight. Hold on. That's that's pretty – I don't want to – you know, I don't want to – burn through like the details when you say not having a place to live so what steps yeah i want to know how, how we got there when when was the first time that i could say that i was actually homeless so it got to the point where my parents were like no no all right so it was like when you say not having a place it was like an argument 
parents are like, no, maybe pa- sleep in the car. Or well, no, parent, parents are like, days. no, you're not allowed to live here anymore because right. every time you come back, it's the same story. Right. You yeah. just threw up. You get fired. You come home drunk and high when you're supposed to be trying to stay clean and sober. So they feel like now they're enabling so, you. So, right. So they didn't want to enable you. It was some tough love. It was like, we love you. You can come over on Sundays for dinner. You, right. You know what I mean? We're still going to pick up your son. We're still going to help you. We're still going to do this. But you're not allowed to live here because... It's almost like we're enabling you to continue these bad decisions. Yeah, so, you have a safety net right now. So the door was closed as far as living there. I could always find a friend or a girlfriend that would let me crash on the couch, but then those options start running out because I was the guy that was like, oh, can I borrow 40 You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You say no, and when you leave the room, the $40 is missing. Okay? Wow. So, so it got, it was to- – Yeah. Okay. So I was that guy, all right? And I'm not proud of that. But like, so now if you let me stay at your house for a couple of weekends, but now your 40 bucks has been missing twice. The first time you think maybe you misplaced it. The second time it's the guy that's staying on your couch. Do you know what I mean? Now it's like, what do you mean, Maurice? What do you mean you didn't bring back the money for the, for the weed you were supposed to bring? You know what I mean? Right. So now it's like, you're not going to help me the next time. Right. You just gave me a shot. So slowly but surely, slowly but surely, I'm burning all my My bridges, bridges. all my bridges. Okay. Um, the so now I'm smoking crack on a daily basis. Okay, um, are you still working at this time? You at have the, to I was working at the mortgage company that didn't last long because it just consumes everything. I'm not going to go to work and make 30 phone calls and fill out paperwork and update a CR, right. and update a CRM if I'm thinking about chasing a crack pipe. It's just they don't go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. I'm literally showing up as like a body filling a seat. And making a couple of phone calls and maybe a little bit of interaction with the customer, but I was That's really, it. I was really starting to lose any type of professional focus, any type of ability to actually perform a job the right way. I can remember someone coming to my, I was had a townhouse that me and a, another drug user were splitting the rent on. Um, he took a medical leave from his job and was and was blowing through his 401k and all of his savings and stuff. So we had this safety net. We had a very nice place to stay. Mm. I was still generating money from the mortgage job and from the drug sales. He had money to blow through. And it was like a bad, like, those are the bad type. Bad combination. Bad combination. What, so now that led me to getting into my first... Um, First experience experience with like um, really committing crimes, right? Really committing crimes to to keep up with the drugs. So I my thing before to keep up with the drugs was I always worked, hustle, always hustle. Figure out a way to make. I'm, I'm either hustling cars, I'm hustling mortgages. I might be working at the supermarket again. I might not be happy, but at least it's a paycheck at the right. end of the week. Um, I never had to rob and steal. Those instances where I might swipe forty bucks from somebody, it was very few and far between because I used to kind of. You still had a conscience. You yeah, were still and I of... used to justify my drug use yeah. as to like at least I'm not stealing. Right, you, you know what I mean. I'm not breaking into cars and in taking world, laptops. Yeah. I'm right. not doing that. I would never like. I used to tell myself I would never do that. Do you know what I mean? But guess what I did do? You started doing it. Started coming up with um, ways. Other to... ways. I went to a local liquor store and asked the guy if I could write him a check and get cash back. All right. Now there was money in the account to cover it the first dozen times. Mm. Okay. Well, when you're smoking crack and drinking liquor for three days and it's Sunday night and the liquor store is about to close, you're desperate. And you're like, I promise there's money in the account. I promise. I promise. Right. And there's no money in the account. But you know that guy's going to give you the money because you've you've done it so many times. You've done it so many times. It's like credit. You have credit. Yes. So now I'm doing that for what seems like a short period of time, but it was probably weeks and weeks and weeks. And now I look back and I remember the guy, he pulled me to the side one day and he was like, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He goes, you owe me some serious money. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, a bunch of those checks came back and there's, they're no good. He goes, what are you going to do to make this right? And he said, I'm going to give you two options. You're going to come in Friday with all my money or I'm going to call my best friend who's the head detective at the, at the Smithfield Police Department. Okay. So I was, here I am. I'm a hustler. I'm not going to go to jail. I'm not going to yeah. let that happen. Mm. Give me till Friday. Give me till Friday. I'll be here. I'll be here. I promise. I'll have the money. Let's make this right. And he's like, you're a How much was it? Roughly about fourteen hundred, about fourteen hundred bucks. Okay, about fourteen hundred bucks total that you don't have that you need to come up with. Right, and I hustled and I did everything and I showed up on Friday and I had like seven or eight hundred bucks. Okay, and I thought that was a great, a great. uh, So I said, here's some money. Here's some money. 
I said, don't call the police. You know, I want to make this right. And he's like, you're a drug addict. I know what you're doing. You're up to no good. You're trying to rip me off. Like he had just had enough. Yeah. He, in his mind, he's probably mad that he let it happen for so long. Right. Right. Cause not for nothing. They weren't even like the name, the checks weren't even mine. Do you know what I mean? Right. So like he knew there was some shadiness going on, but the money was there. The checks weren't bouncing at first. So it was no big deal. So not to spend too much time on that. The cops did come. Right. On Monday, they did come. They showed up at They your... showed up. They took, surrounded the house, took me in. And one of the deals that I had with my buddy that I was living with at the time was if any of the shit ever hit the fan, I was going to admit that it was me passing the checks because it was. Right. They were his checks, but I was the one physically passing them. So I said, if anything happens, I'll take the fall. Take the rap. And I did. Went to jail for a solid like nine months because it was a serious charge. It was felony forgery. Okay. Right. Now I'm charged with felony. So here I am, former honor roll student, four-year college plans, beautiful girlfriend, beautiful son. But none of that stuff is enough to keep me grounded and focused. I'm just like, everything's about the coke, the liquor, the drugs. Everything's about that. And I'm here I am years later, years later of, of chasing drug addiction, landing in jail, okay, when I got out that time, I did say, that's it. I'm never going back. I'm going to stay clean. I'm going to stay sober. Um, and I did for a little while, okay? How long? Probably months and not years. Um, Which compared to what you had just been through, months is a long time. Of right. So let's, um, what happened next was more just jobs to make it just to make it through so that's i got a construction job was making good money is this while you Um, were clean like you stayed clean i stayed clean for a little while but in the back of my head i'm thinking when can i stop partying again when can i i'm not what's a little while um i thought you just said months oh months yeah matter of months matter of months now in in your head is it kind of like not like a hey i'm i'm clean this is my new life is it a i'm kind of in a rough spot right now I'll bounce back oh, on my feet yeah. and get so high I, again. It wasn't enough. Like I wasn't owning the clean in sobriety. Like I wasn't. I no. wasn't. I wasn't. It was, I'm down right now. I'll be I, up again and exactly. be partying again. Um, <laughs> and so we have to touch on the fact that when that when the rampant crack use started, um, I was introduced to another part of of my story, and. That was the the sex for money, okay? Um, and this was before jail. Before this you go was clean? after jail. This after was jail. after jail. Um, and let me just make sure I get this right. Timeline, yep. So after jail, I so this what is what year, happened. What year do you think this was? Just so we can kind of, it'll help us 2000, follow. 2005 and 2006. Okay. I'm going to tell you. So what's after the mortgage thing. Yeah, you so know, 2005, after. 2006. And let me tell you what was going on. I used to use the adult video stores as a place to go do my drugs, okay? I was honestly naive to anything else that was going on in those places. Right. I thought you locked the door, put a couple dollars in, watch the porno, and I used it as a place to sniff lines. I wasn't even, I wasn't doing the crack. So I, I know I'm kind of mixing up the timeline a it's little okay. bit here, but I wanted to touch on this. And this is, it's not something that I'm happy about sharing, but it's part of my story. Um, anything you don't want to share. Yeah, no, 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 because I, I would never hold anything back. So now I'm in this booth and I'm getting high and the door's locked. And just for people that are ignorant, like myself, you know, that was a little before. My time, I was probably still, you know, pretty oh, young. You there. Little, yeah. But in those, so those video stores and those booths, what, did it's prostitution a, happen there? Or? So that's a good question. So this is an adult video store. In my mind, you're just going into the booth and you're, right. you're jerking off and watching the porn. That's what yeah. I would think so of. We just talked what, about that, right? So that's what right I'm that thinking. Point. Somebody's knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. And I'm like, what the fuck? Well, you know what I mean? Because now I'm buzzing. I'm high. I'm, I'm taking a little shot of liquor. I right. sniffed a line. I'm watching the porno. Because yeah. yeah. a lot of my drugs... The drugs and the sex came, it was like they went hand in hand. Right. A lot of the, 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 the sexual addiction and, and the pornography addiction fed right in with the cocaine. Yeah. It was, it was just so bad. That, and I look back, yeah, I look back at it and I was like, how could you be so gross for so long? But that, that's just what it is. Um, so somebody's knocking on the door, knocking on the door. I open the door and he's like, let me in. And, I, and I'm like, no, I'm totally freaked out. Totally freaked out. Just a random. Just a random guy. 
And he's like, let me in, let me in. Now, now mine, and I don't want to, I don't, I don't like to talk like I'm offending anybody or anything like that, but I was very naive to any type of gay sex. Okay. Right. Any mm-hmm. type of, uh, any type of stuff like that. I was very naive to anything like that. So this gentleman is literally holding money in his hand and saying, let me in. I just want to, I just want to jerk off next to you. It's literally what he said. Mm. So now the drug addict part of me sees the, the few, money. the few $20 bills he's holding and I don't have that much money in my pocket because right, right. I've been get, drinking and getting high for two days. Yeah. So if, so now I'm like, all right. So I let the guy in. And for that's exactly what he does. He jerks off next to me and gives me the money and leaves and asks me if I'm going to be down there again. So mm. now this is all rushing through my head. And I'm like, holy shit, this is what happens at these places. So this now, is the culture. This is yeah, the, so that's now, actually news to like, so This is the first time I'm found, ever hearing of this. I had just made 60 bucks in like... Three, three minutes, okay? Yeah. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, so as a drug addict, it was like a jackpot. Right. Do you right. know what I mean? You, you just landed the, the best job as a yeah, drug addict. You know. I wasn't thinking that I'm a, a oh, gay, a gay male prostitute, jerk right? Off yeah. Jerk off next so now I, come, but now I go back to that place, try to hustle up some more money, right? Now, granted. Are you? Are, are you going back to that place and make, you know. So now, so, so to answer your question, that place was within walking distance of one of my local drug houses where i felt comfortable going right okay so with that 60 bucks i went literally ran up the street wow got high and when the money and the drugs ran out went back went back now wow so it's like clockwork so it introduced me to that kind of lifestyle met other guys doing the same thing as me chasing drugs and then hanging out and that that normalizes it to some degree if your surroundings are doing the same exact thing that's what i mean so now i'm like it got so bad that I started to take pride in what I was doing and started to pay attention on how I could get better. Okay. Wow. Let me let me make sure I look good when I go down there. Yeah. Let, let me make sure you know I, I get a fresh haircut tomorrow morning and don't look like a scrub because I'm going to be asking a guy to give me money. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Right. Right. I'm right, trying right. to become the best male street hustler that I can be, and that's pathetic because it was just it escalated so fast. So I think that's a, a really uh. Not to, obviously they're very different, and you know, like at a young age you were an overachiever. But to me, it's how how deep that you know, like hustling mentality is in you. That even at, even at your lowest, you're thinking you're still trying to be the how best. can I be yes. the best at this? You right. Know, so and I used to kind of like try to bizarre. set myself apart. So now, so what would you do? You'd get a fresh air. Anything else you would do? So that one location. Through that one location, I met somebody that put me on to another location that was just a busier location. There was a location with two video stores and a strip club and what was known as like a back street right. where, where everybody hung out, um, where guys from out of state not only drove down to look for guys to hang out with, but they looked for drugs. And they, the, the big thing in this location was guys looking to not get ripped off. And my selling point was, I'm not going to rip you off. What was the normal way that guys would get ripped off? What would... Me taking your money and not coming back with the drugs because... If oh, you're, okay. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. These guys were coming down there not looking for sex. They were looking for drugs. Do you know what I mean? And and this was like, this is what happened in this area. So now I'm kind of taking this opportunity and being like, I'm that guy. I'm not going to rip you off. Right. I'm going to sit and do your drugs with you all night, but I'm not going to rip you right. off. So now I have like return customers. Right. I have people that are literally coming on a... Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night looking for me because I gave them a good experience the last you. time. They trust me. But I'm thinking to myself, like, and you said that I was very self-aware. I was. I would have talks with myself, like, Maurice, you're better than this. You're not a piece of shit. Why are you prostituting yourself? You know, why are you hanging out with guys for drug money? Why are you letting somebody touch you? Why, like, do you, why are you doing this? You're better than this, mm-hmm. right? But it was never enough. It was, um, the self-talk wasn't enough. I got to the point where maybe a couple more times back in and out of jail, whether it was three months or six months, really tried it to stay clean. Um, now, what what are those for? Are those for drug charges? Are those for yeah, just a possession, a domestic violence, um, all things. So now, I'm not a violent guy. Right. Okay? Not a violent guy at all. But you put drugs and alcohol in the mix. You put you mood swings a- in the mix. And then and then there's there's some violence issues there. So I'm not proud of these things. Um but that's it's incredible, what, and and I appreciate it, man. Because it, the way that you're able to open up and talk about these things is 
So I, I can't even put myself in that mindset. But I had friends that impressive. were always willing to be like, Maurice, are you going to try to stay clean now? Are you going to try to do the right thing? So quick story, I went to a buddy's barbershop and... Him and I had had problems before sniffing coke. We hung out before sniff coke. We both struggled with it a little bit. My <laughs> my thing was like I always took it to the next level. I was always the guy that just took the partying to the next level. You might say it's time to go home. The wife's waiting for me. Or I got to go pick up the kids tomorrow. Or I got to make sure I'm at work Monday morning. And I'm, those things aren't even affecting me. I'm still partying. If you don't want to still party, that's fine. I'll go to the ATM by myself. You know right. what I mean? I'm, <laughs> that's You're doing your way, own thing. Like That's the way that I was. I went to my buddy's barbershop. I had been clean for like a couple of months, two or three months. I'm feeling good. I think I had a job interview the next day. <coughs> I wanted to get a fresh lineup. And he asked me if I could help him make a delivery, okay? Drug delivery. Two bags of Coke, yeah. okay? Now, in hindsight, you don't ask a friend that's a Coke head that's clean for two months to go make a Coke delivery for that's you, right. okay? It's, it's no different than oh, two months, yeah, Yeah, of so two or three months, I'm, I'm trying to paint the picture. It's like offering yeah. a you know, recovering alcoholic if he wants a beer. He right, knows. exactly, yeah, just have one beer. Have some common sense. Right, exactly. You know? So he gives me the instruction. Like he, I, I, So my addictive personality was already the gears were turning. He asked me for help to do, to not only to deliver the bags, but to find the customer that needed them. Does that make sense? So like he was like, I'm in a jam. I need to get rid of these two bags. Yeah, he's leaning on your experience. Yeah, and, right. And so I knew with a couple phone calls, I could off these two bags. Well, I called somebody. They said they would take one, not both. I lied and said, oh, the guy wants both. Give them to me. Give me a car. I'll be right back, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm going to make a quick 50 bucks off each bag, maybe take a little bit out. That's how the addict mind was working, course, right. right? So um, take... Take the car, take the two bags. Immediately when I'm in the car, I open one of the bags and I sniff a line. Now, mind you, I'm a former cokehead, crackhead with two or three months clean. That first line of coke set me off. The set me off. So now right. I'm like, that was pretty good. I wonder how good it will be if I cook it up, because right. that's how a drug addict thinks. I went because straight. And you already explained that when you cooked it into yeah. crack the first time, it was a much. So I went straight to this drug house where I felt comfortable, where I knew there would be somebody there that would be happy to see me with two big bags of coke. And I completely just blew off the world, sat in that house literally for two days until all the drugs and liquor was gone. Then I was so like what they call like stuck and geeked out yeah. with the drugs and the activity over the last couple of days. My buddy with the barbershop had been calling me, okay? Wants to know where his car is, wants to know where his money is, wants to know where his drugs are. Wow, so this um, whole time you had his car, his drugs. But I money. just realized that I had the car because I was so gone. So now I realize how I have the car. Now I make the, another bad decision. I rent it out to the local drug dealers that are down the street that are want, they want to know whose car that is because it's, it's a nice car, yeah. right? So now I give it to them for like two days. Jesus. So now we're three, four days into this endeavor. Okay? And this guy doesn't have his car. He doesn't have his car. So the police get involved. Calling him, you're probably not answering. Not answering. Mm -hmm. Police get involved. And basically he said, Yo, he's like, I love you like a brother. We grew up together. He's like, you need help. Um, and in my mind, I'm like, well, you do coke too. But he wasn't taking his buddy's car. You know right. what I mean? So right. he was right. He's like, you need, you need help. If you get help, I won't press charges. Okay. So that was my, that you was my motive. Good people in your life, man. That was my motivation, but I still needed to make that step. Now let's back up a little bit. When I was talking about the mortgage companies and stuff, there was a, there was a night where I literally didn't have anywhere to go because the fr I was burning bridges. Mm -hmm. There was no girlfriend in the picture at the time. My parents weren't going to let me go home. It was a Friday night, and I had already blown my commission check. I didn't even have enough money to get a, like a sixty dollar hotel. Okay, oh. and I was with a friend who was in the same situation. We wow. literally went. We were. We were, thought we were so cool on federal. Just to Hill. put it in perspective, what, what was that commission check like? Roughly, the like amount. a fifteen hundred dollar check. But like we just went through one the previous Friday and promised ourselves that this next Friday You're we're not, not going to blow so it. So in a right? few, oh, we're talking about a few hours. We're talking about yeah, hours. six hours, seven hours. We're going through that type of money because. I'm buying three hundred dollars worth of coke, but I might owe the dealer three hundred from the week before. So that's six hundred bucks right there. Right. And now I'm the guy that I'm paying for all your drinks because I'm the cool guy that just got the big commission check and I got the coke. Do you know what I mean? And so we literally had nowhere to go. He introduced me to a shelter on Cranston Street in Providence. Um, we walked in that night and said we needed a place to stay. I was scared. I had never been in a homeless shelter. I'd never been mm -hmm. in a situation where I had nowhere to go. I always had a friend I could call or knock on their door and they'd let me in. Do you in. remember what that place is called? Yeah, the Providence Rescue Mission. So we, now, where were you living at the time? Um, there. 
Well, no, no, no I this, had. This is like the first time it happened, right? Like, where you did you? Yeah, just get I had a on? I had a girlfriend that I was living with in. I don't know if we were in Providence or Boston because she had a place in Boston. I had a buddy in East Providence that was letting me crash on his couch. But like I said, I was just everything everything around. out of my mouth was a lie at this point. Right. You know right. what I mean? And this I night, couldn't, one way or another, there was nobody. There was no way to go. Yes. Yeah, there was no, no way. There was nobody time. saying yes. Nobody answering the phone. And it was like getting close to be the middle of the night, and I had to lay my head somewhere. So I remember walking into this place, and um, they let us stay there. They gave us a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a can of Coca-Cola, a clean blanket. I remember seeing the cross on the wall. <clears throat> I never want to act like I'm like super spiritual and everything. Um, I am a, a born-again Christian, and I've been saved and so forth, but I'm not living a life that is perfect, so I don't like to get up and preach and stuff. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I remember sleeping under the cross thinking I'm safe, but I knew that place existed in the back of my mind. So when my buddy said, you need help, go get help, and <coughs> and I won't press charges, <coughs> I walked, I went to that place, and I said, do you guys have a program? Is there is there a drug right, program? So this is a few years later now, right? This or, was, yeah, less than a few years, okay. but it was a ways down the road. And this I, is tying back to you going on the bend and taking your buddy's <laughs> taking car. Taking the buddy's okay. car, exactly. So when he said, you need help, go get help. That spot came to mind, and I went there, and I said, will you accept me in your program? And they did a little bit of paperwork. They asked me some questions. They said, are you serious about getting help? I said, yes. They told me the rules, how you can't leave for the first 30 days, how there's Bible studies, wow. there's chores. Are you ready? I said, yes. You couldn't even call your parents for, the, for, for 30 days. Like You can call them to tell them you're going to be here. But then that's it. You're not allowed to use the phone for 30 days. It's almost similar to like military. Like They want to break you down and get everything bad out of you. And So... Now, I make it through 30 days. I feel, <coughs> I feel friggin' golden. What's yeah, happening right? through these 30 days? You're doing chores, obviously. I'm doing chores. You going to I'm meetings. reading the Bible. We're doing meetings. Um, we're talking about everything. I'm not using. I'm They're right. keeping feeling your mind good. busy. And yeah. I'm did you have any, any, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but while you were there for those 30 days, obviously, the, that 30 days, we can say it was a success. You didn't use, it was good. Was there anybody that was using? Did you have to deal with any, you know, No, but the or... neighborhood that we were in, literally, like, if I wanted to go back to drugs, I could just walk out the front gate and go. Right. So a lot of it was your own willpower. Yeah. And, saying, no. okay. and I, so, after those 30 days, you're able to fill out a pass to leave for a few hours. Now, I had a legitimate reason to leave. I had to go down to the courthouse. I had a scheduled court date, probably for one of my court fines or one of my child support hearings. So I had to go handle that. And they said, sure, sign out. Here's your pass. You'll be back in a few hours. Now, they give you like a $7 a week stipend while you're there, okay? And my thing was I quit smoking cigarettes, everything, because I'm, I'm clean. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to do the right thing now. I'm reading the Bible. I'm not going back to drugs. Right. Oh, my God, Maurice, you were a crackhead. Thank God that you, you, know, you, you smartened up. You're never, you're never going $7? back. $7? Seven? $7 a week, right? All right? So now here's the story. You got like 30 bucks at this point. Yeah, exactly. I go downtown to the courthouse, and it's a quick fix. I walk in. I have the letter from the program. Hey, Your Honor, I can't pay my court fines today. I'm in a program. I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to get clean and sober. I've been clean for 30 days. They love that stuff. Oh, yeah, they're, of course. So they're like, great job. We'll see you in a few months. Come back when you finish the program. Keep up the good work, Mr. Loman, right? So it's quick, you said. So it's quick and, up, so quick and easy. Time. So now I'm down Kennedy Plaza, Providence. I run into somebody from when I was running the streets that owes me money that actually has it and wants to pay it to me and was like, hey, don't I owe you some money? Oh my and gosh. they were like, and they hand me like 40 <laughs> How bucks. How often does that happen? That's what I mean. And they hand me like 40 bucks and like, can we squash it for 40? And I'm like, oh yeah, of course. Like it was $80 yeah, I thought I would like, never, never get again, right? Again. So for someone to say, can we, I'm like, oh, of course we can, right? And he gives me the try, money. Try to avoid hitting this uh -huh. just because of the money. Yeah, so he gives me the money. So now I have $68 in my pocket. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, yeah. right? And the, the money has always been my trigger. Getting yeah. the job with the high commission checks and thinking that money can save everything. Money was always my trigger because in my mind, on a Friday, in my mind, I was always going to do it better the next time. Right. I'm not going to blow my whole check next Friday. I'm going to pay the bills. I'm going to do the right thing. And then I'm going to go buy my coat. Well, that never happened. So that 68 bucks was the trigger. I went straight to the bar, ordered a shot of liquor, ordered a second shot. And then ask somebody to use a phone so I could call a local drug dealer that I knew would answer, okay? As soon as he answered, I bought a bag, called somebody else that I knew would be willing to drink and get high with me. Wow. And did that. So now, it's about 5 or 6 p.m. 
the day pass was only good till 3 or 4 p.m. It's 5 or 6 p.m. and I'm drinking and using Coke and I just thrown away 30 days of sobriety and 30 days of, of, of a good standing in a program. So I didn't know what to do. I was scared. Um, so the next morning I take a shower and I go back to the program. Yeah. Where are you? At, at a buddy's house okay. in like Massachusetts or something. And um, I, But I have this big plan, right? I'm going to tell them that they held me at the courthouse. They took me into custody and they held me overnight and I'm here today and, and don't well. Obviously, nobody's going to believe that. Well, it sounded, you know, in your head, in though, my it head, sounds it sounded, it sounded brilliant. Right? Yeah. So I show up at the program, and the first thing they say is, well, where's your paperwork? Like, you don't go to the ACI and get released and not have any paperwork, right? Where's your court paperwork? Where's the, where's the thing that you have to sign that says you're anything. going to jail? Where's anything? So I'm like, oh, I left it in my car, in my buddy's car. We'll call him right now. Call him and get the paperwork back. So I'm like, no, but I don't have it, but I want to be here. I want I, I, I want to... Mm-hmm. And they were like, all right, well, then you're going to take a drug test, right? And yeah, I was like, uh, so so basically my, sto- you, yeah. my story wasn't going anywhere. And the guy who ran the program, the pastor, was like, Maurice, I love you, brother. Yeah. Okay? I love you. You're a good guy. I can tell that you want this. But you're not any different from anybody else that comes through these walls. And you broke the biggest rule. You relapsed on drugs and alcohol. You are no longer allowed in the program, wow. come back in 30 days. So now I couldn't handle that. I was like, what am I going to do? I just had yeah. that phone call a few days ago to my mom saying, I'm doing great. You know, I'll call you. You got nowhere to, to go now. Right? Oh, right. So now I'm like, I literally had nowhere to go. And I didn't want to go back out and do drugs and alcohol, but it was, it was too late because I had done that. So not to, I don't want to spend too much time, but he, he said, let me, let me tell you this. He goes, I can tell you want this. I'm going to make an exception. You come back in two really? weeks. Really? Yeah. He wow. said, you come back in two weeks, and you can give me a clean urine, and your bed will still be here. Wow. Just, you, you, can, you can even keep your stuff here, okay, which was unheard of. Because when you're homeless or you're on the streets, your biggest fear is where am I going to put my stuff? Right. Do you know what I mean? And now, safe and, even though I'm even though I'm only 30 days into the program, I was starting to collect things. I had a couple of books, a couple of nice shirts from the right. donation band. Well, you don't have much. You don't have you much, do but have what I do have, I felt really important. good about it, right? Yeah. A couple of letters and stuff. So he said, you can come back in two weeks with a clean urine, and we'll let you back in, okay? So let me speed it up a little bit. Um, somebody let me crash on their couch for a couple of days. I wasn't completely clean. I had a couple of beers and I smoked a little bit of weed, but I told myself there was no way I was going to do coke or crack because if I did, I would never like stop in time between before the two weeks was up. Does that make sense? Yeah. I knew I could like smoke a joint and drink a beer and not go crazy. Okay. Right. It wasn't the best decision. No. Okay. It's rationalizing it. Rationalizing it. it. Right. So as it got closer to the two week period, I stopped, no drinking beer, no smoking pot, and I was just drinking water because now I'm scared I want to pass the drug test. Right. My buddy at the time, my cousin at the time, um, was like, listen, it's the, it was 4th of July weekend. That two weeks fell on a 4th of July weekend. And he was like, do you want to come out with us on the boat? We got the Heinekens, we got the girls, we got the fireworks, or do you want me to drop you off at that program? I said, drop me off at the program. God damn, and you he, got some strong willpower, So man. he said, he goes, I'm so proud of you, you know, because everybody knew I had a problem. Right. right. So the fact that I'm taking this step. Boats, fa- bitches, booze, <laughs> so, you're like, no, nah, take me to the rehab. Yeah, like, so I went, back, I, went back takes to, a strong I went back to the rehab, and at that point, I knew. Because I, I was so I was so hungry for that first 30 days feeling. Like, yeah, I felt awesome. good about myself. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was like, I'm not losing this again. So I was like gung-ho. I was, I was the, I was the first one in class. I'm reading the Bible. I'm volunteering to read out loud. I'm doing the extra chores. I'm, I'm talking to other guys about how good it is to be clean and sober. So two months turned to three months, turned to four months, turned to five months. I graduate the program. I'm clean. How long is the program when you graduated? It's supposed to or? between nine and twelve months, depending on your progress, now, right? So it is since it's, I don't want to yeah. interrupt. I just I don't I want to follow the timeline. So since you were let's say twenty two. This is the longest this you've the ever been. The longest clean. I've ever been clean from alcohol, so tobacco, cocaine, and so marijuana. it's almost to say that for it's most like, of your life, this is the best you've ever been. Correct. So, and, and is this the standard kind of twelve step thing? So program there or? was some twelve step aspects to it. It wasn't a twelve step program. It was right. more Christian based. Okay. You had to find a church. You had to find a mentor. You had to do some community service I mean, stuff. Did you have a sponsor and all that stuff? Not a sponsor, but like a mentor. Okay. So right. an older, so someone older than me. 
that was a member of the church or active in the community that I could be very vocal about right. about my problems, and talk and about, about my issues. Yeah. But I was like, I was on top of the world. I'm like, I'm the guy that just gave up coke, crack, pornography, prostitution. I gave it Everything. all up. Like yeah. here I am. Like I felt awesome. Right. You survived. And I survived. I became a resident assistant at that program, so I actually worked for the program, okay, wow. and I got a real paycheck. I lived there for free, got a real paycheck, was helping the new members come into the program, and I put together close to three years of sobriety and clean time. The nice. next step after that program was to move into a halfway house. I found this is after three years. This was right around the three-year mark. Wow, so, so this is really a, a process. It's oh, not like, yeah. hey... Come get clean for six months and now no, you're back I stayed. On your own. I stayed and I like because I knew because so after a year, I knew I wasn't ready to go back out. Right, and I because I I loved so what I had. That you so, acknowledge that, like, yeah, you were able to, I knew to I wasn't ready because like I did nine months in jail before and I got out and went back to the streets. Right, so just because so I did six months here, and, yeah, and I was listening. I was finally starting to listen to people because not for nothing, I'm going to be thirty years old soon. I'm obviously doing something wrong, okay? Right. I don't. I obviously don't have it all right. figured out, okay? If I'm homeless in a shelter, getting my life back together, right? So, um, the next step was to go into a halfway house, okay? Mm -hmm. To so for I, everybody that's listening that that may not know what is a, a, a sober house? house that has a lot of rules, a curfew, okay. Um, other gentlemen that are in recovery. So I okay. lived in a house with four or five other gentlemen. Like roommates? All roommates. Okay. But this was a real house. Someone owned the house. There was a house manager. And they provide food, They provide bed. food, cable, bed, everything. And it was it was a real rent. I had so it's, it's like a step to getting your freedom back. Correct. Gotcha. So who, who actually funds these halfway ho houses? Are they... At the time, there were federal grants that you could apply for to get help with the rent. Right. But you're responsible for your rent. So my rent was 150 bucks a week, I think. But that covered cable, internet, laundry, food. It covered everything. Right. Okay. We would make a lot. We'd make a, a grocery list out on a Sunday night, and by Monday night, the, the fridge would be full. It was a wow. very good situation. Yeah, that it sounds was, like it's really you know, geared to help. Very structured. Back in. If you missed curfew, you were getting a urine test on the spot. Right. There was zero tolerance. There was. And if was, you failed, you were out. You were out. So, next step. I, and this is where the new Maurice comes into play, I scratched on the surface a little bit to back up. When I was first in that program, remember how I told you you couldn't leave for 30 days? Mm -hmm. I was out in the parking lot running. That was my go. Running, okay, was always my go-to fix. Like, let's say I had a real shitty weekend, right? On Monday morning, if I had nowhere to go, like no job to go to or whatever, I'd literally like put something on and go for a jog, go for a run. It was my release. It was like, Maurice, there's more to life than just drinking and drugs. Right. So I used to get a little bit of a fix, a little bit of, of a rush off the running. The it, runner's high. Yeah, a little yeah, bit, but it was like nothing. Are yeah, nothing crazy. Nothing. I wasn't at any type of fitness level or any type of consistency level to call myself a runner. I just right. knew I liked to jog. Right. I liked to run. Okay. Some guys go to the gym yeah. when it's time to get clean it's and some, sober. Somewhat, it Something. filled a little bit of a void. That, right. You know. So now I'm in this program. I can't leave for 30 days. I ran outside in the parking lot every day. That was my, that was my release. Would you run around the parking I, lot? Yeah, or I wasn't slaps? allowed to leave the yeah. property. Right. Right. And I would do 20 minutes, turn to 30 minutes, turn to 40 minutes. And I remember thinking how good it was going to feel when they opened those gates after 30 days and I could actually run down to the park and mm -hmm. do some real laps and then run down the street. I had a, that's when we had portable CD players. Oh, I remember. You know what I mean? So like. Did you have the uh, anti-skip? Uh, it was skipping. Yeah. It was skipping all over the place. But whatever. It was just. I so, remember carrying those on the um, way to school. You're walking so on steady. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to touch on that because the running and, and there's a huge part of my of my childhood that that I, that I wanted to touch on in a second, as to why running is such a big part of my life now. Mm, don't get into it yet. Though. Okay, so I'm out of the program. I'm living in the sober house, and I, I'm running on a daily basis. I'm running for like 60 minutes, 90 minutes. I'm feeling good about myself. I'm coming home. I'm doing push-ups, a little bit of light weights. I'm going to church on the weekend. I'm seeing my son on the weekend. I'm hanging out with my parents again. Things are aligning. Things are good. I had a van. Okay, that was registered and insured. My license was legit. Like this is while you're in the halfway house. Yeah, so nice. everything's falling in place. I have a full time job working construction wow. in Boston. So like for somebody to get out of jail 
as a as a drug addict. You know what I mean? Like I yeah, yeah, here's yeah. somebody that was like a homeless drug addict. You're like not, living the the, the, the dream. dream you know? like, like I have a van. I have a job. Like my, I'm looking forward to my paycheck on Friday. I'm doing the right thing. Right. Like things are falling into place. Right. Um, started to. That's right around when I got introduced to like Facebook. I mean, it was always like MySpace and stuff. Right. But Facebook changed Facebook, the game. Though. Facebook changed the game. I was able. I remember the first time I posted something about sobriety. And I remember all the likes and the positive feedback. And they talk about it all the time. I mean, I was, the addict part of me was feeding off of that. I was right. like, wow. Like, I haven't heard the from attention. This, the, yeah, I haven't heard from this person right. in six years. And they're telling me, Maurice, you look great. You, you're doing great. So it was like, I was almost like missing for years. Because when I was out on the streets chasing drugs, it's not like I was taking selfies. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's right. like, so like, I, so I'm like, so now, so the whole social media thing was like, brand new to me because when like when it was myspace and stuff i was kind of bad it's with drugs. Same, yeah it's not yeah. the same so when i saw that that was like a positive react like i had a, it was a real positive thing mm. for me to to get all that positive feedback on my first like post about sobriety um but there was something missing something in the back of my head was always saying that i had one more time to go out and go and go crazy so it's like you you deserved one more celebration exactly. going out the it was like some entitled, closure it was you know, like, like entitlement you earned it like, yeah and I'm like and i'm out and i'm not going to do nothing crazy this time i'm not going to steal my friend's car i'm not going to you know what i mean i'm not going to blow my just whole check spend a, a couple yeah, hundred a bucks bit, right? party for a night and that's what happened one weekend wait so this is after the 3 years being oh clean. so this so i think i was just about to hit i tell i, I i'm a little blurry on the on the on the um, it doesn't have to be exact yeah, but, but it's, it's a few right years. around it's 3 years. years so i got the van i'm hmm. i'm in the halfway you would, house you would family think that trust after me 3 and years like in me my my ignorance may show but i'm thinking after 3 years this isn't an issue anymore like the issue is gone but you have so that's, that's forever stay, an issue. Yeah, that's why right. I stay vocal well, about I don't, it to this day, you know. because like right now, I'm not tempted by like the smell of beer or, or whiskey or we something. Can move this. No, can no. Move. But what I'm saying is like, and if you had six lines of cocaine right here, I wouldn't want to do them. But like, it if I was here every day for the next two weeks and there was coke here every day for yeah. the next two weeks, that might be an issue. You know what I mean? Right. So like, it's yeah. oh, I'm always going to be a coke addict. Okay, I can say no to it right now. Right. But well, I don't that, know if I can say. Be a, what a and, powerful thing to say. Yeah. Well, and and an, let honest, me ask you, an honest thing to say, you know, because I feel like you, it's almost like you're accepting like, hey, this is something that I'm I'm just going to deal with and be stronger than forever, you know, and, and have to deal with. And I yep. feel like a lot of people may relapse because like my ignorant statement earlier thinking, OK, that part of my life is over. I can start again and just not make the same mistakes. So where you realize um, like I can't drink. Not. Right. Because to me, there's no joy in drinking liquor without cocaine. Okay, right. I don't drink for a buzz. I don't drink to appreciate the fine taste of a good ale. I right. don't drink to appreciate the taste of a good scotch. I drink to get smashed and then to do coke to get out of that smash mode. So that's wow. that's that was it. I never drank because I like the taste of beer. I drank to get drunk to do to get to do more drugs. When I was at that point with the 3 years clean and stuff, something told me in the back of my head that I could get away with one more night, okay? I made up this big story. I was going to be sleeping at a friend's house. We're ordering the fight. I don't know if it was a Mayweather fight. I don't know what it was. You made this up to I'm, the people at the I'm halfway at the, house? Yeah, that I, had, that I had a reason to sleep out, okay? I had a legitimate sleep out before. I slept at my parents' house with my son. It was great. Yeah. You know what I mean? But now I'm thinking, all right, I slept out at my parents' house last time. Nobody said anything. Said anything? You know? So now I'm going to, here I am creating this big story. I'm going to stay at my friend's house. We're watching the fight. There's not going to be any drugs or alcohol. Of course there's not. I'm going to get a drug test when I come back. I would be stupid to do anything, mm -hmm. right? Right. So Friday night, I stay out all night, did some drugs, did and some alcohol. No, I did coke. Year. This is 2009-ish, maybe? Correct. About 10 2009, years ago, years 2010, ago. yep. Um, that one night, I got away with it. Nobody suspected anything, Okay. Did my normal routine. No drug test when you came back. No drug test when I came back because I had built such a level of trust. Right. I was the guy that was like going to church early to help set up. I was you were smart shop. enough to come back pretty straight. Yeah. Not so when I came back, I did my routine, a little bit of working out, went for a jog, went to church on Sunday morning. The next Friday night, I tried doing the same thing, going out, getting high and drunk and coming wow. back to the house. One of the guys in the house was like, I think you need to drug test Maurice. I think he's up to something. So now I'm scrambling. I asked my buddy to pee in a cup for me. I'm going to try. I'm trying. But it, there was no there was no way out. Right. There was no way out. I had to pee in a cup. 
It was going to get, it was an on the spot drug test, obviously. Tested positive for cocaine. Kicked out. Literally. Just like that. No, no there's no. no second chances. You, you wow. broke the number one rule. The only rule in a sober house is to stay sober. Okay. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so. What's going through your mind? Like, I'm sorry. If, if, it, if it's too much, just it's let me know. It's not that it's too much, but like in my mind, I'm thinking. As you're peeing in that, like, what's going through your head? Is it like. I'm thinking. Scared? Of, is it under, like trying to accept that it's over? Like, I'm thinking I can fix it. I can fix it. There's I'm a gonna, level of maybe yeah. superiority yeah, to the drug test, to the what's going on. I'm thinking like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just going to get this. myself back up. I'm going to fix this. I'm, they might be kicking me out, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to fix this. So now I'm thinking, can't tell my parents. Can't, you know what I mean? So now you have to lie about to why lie. you need a place to right. stay. Right. So now I just, I don't know how I got so lucky, but there was a friend that was willing to let me stay with her for a couple of weeks. Now my story to everybody was that I got into a verbal argument that turned into a physical altercation and I was kicked out for two weeks. I would never. that's better than the drugs. It's better than admitting that I went back to drugs and alcohol. Well, guess what? Now I I still got this full-time job and I got no structure and no accountability. I'm staying on a friend's couch. Right. Okay? Guess what I did the next Friday? Went and bought a bunch of Coke. Went and drank all night. Went and got high all night. So now I'm on this downward spiral. Now I'm barely hanging on to this job, okay? It got to the point where I'm on Cranston Street in Providence and I'm trying to sell my van for drug money because wow. I... So crazy how quick it how just spiral quick down. I it's thought like I could get away with one. You're on top of the world. Exactly. And then, so boom. Three, we're talking three, four weeks, right? Yeah. Three, four we're weeks. We're talking three, four weeks of hardcore drug and alcohol abuse wow. and that bad. led me to the point where I'm blowing off my job, okay, and I'm literally looking to sell my van for drug money. I'm thinking I can get a quick couple grand and, you know, that'll be good. And this right? is 2009 or 10. 2009 right or 10. So then um, I got mixed up with some more. Now my solution was the was the street work, the prostitution. I knew yeah. I could make money. I knew this. Go, it's like you get in. Uh, that's a human. And, and obviously the, the drugs played a part in that, but I feel like that's just a, like a natural instinct, you, you go to what you're comfortable with, to what you know will work and I, so your safety net. It, that's a good way to put it. And I went back to those same locations. Wow. And just and now I'm thinking to myself, wow. Like I literally would wake up in the morning and be like, you are a loser. Like how did you become a scumbag again? How did you throw away everything that you had going? Why do you have... That's got to be worse than why the first you, time. Like, why are you... Oh, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm looking around, and I got packs of cigarettes, bottles of liquor, empty crack pipes. I'm, I look like dirt. Like, I'm dirty. I, I don't look good. My Like, you know what I mean? Did you ever... In, in these... Because it does... One thing that you've... You know, you've never talked about, or I, whether it's an issue or it wasn't an issue, but uh, I'm not too well-versed on, you know drug addiction and, and mental health issues, but I feel like a lot of stories I've heard kind of correlate the two when there's a lot of drug use, there's depression involved. Do you, do you feel like you ever dealt with depression or, you know, um, had suicidal thoughts or anything like that? You, you know, hit like, it on the head when you said superiority. My problem was always entitlement and superior. It was always like, I deserve to do this. I busted mm. my ass all week at work. Right. Why can't I buy a $50 bag of Coke? Like, that was always my, mm. that was always my justification. justification. Like, right. you know what I mean? You can't tell me I can't party tonight. Right, you, I just you busted go, my ass. Yeah, you didn't go to work all week. You didn't hustle up this money. You right. know what I mean? You didn't, right. you didn't hang out with that guy for two hours. So now, it's and I... To- it's tough to not feel that way too when you work that hard. That's so I, what I mean. But then I went from working hard to hanging out with guys that you know that w- want me to take my clothes off for money and stuff. And it's like, so and and I know I'm I'm treading kind of lightly on that subject. It's all right. Whatever. Because I was always like, well, I'm not prostituting myself because I wasn't it's like, another rationalization. Yeah, I wasn't like having sex, but I was hanging out with guys that, that like paying you wanted to... me to take my shirt off. Do you know what I mean? Right. So you're like, pretty, let's, pretty much tiptoeing yeah, that line. Yeah, I'm tiptoeing that, that line. And then, so now when I'm on the street and I had nowhere to go, okay, someone introduced me to an actual strip club where they hired guys like myself. And I'm literally on a stage in my underwear making wow. money. And now that as was... As a male stripper. As a male stripper. And now you can't tell a crack addict that five, $600 a night is a bad idea. 
there was nothing wow. stopping me. You know what I mean? I was so fueled by that little At that avenue. Point, it's it's got to be a f- scary because now you can probably support your habit and still live a normal like. I the was life supporting that you my to. habit and listen to how bad it was. I was supporting my habit and staying at a local homeless shelter, okay? Making that kind of money. Making that kind of money and going to work at a strip club, now, even with to, that kind of money, going to a drug house, blowing all that money, and wow. then having nowhere to go. So if I couldn't crash at like the house where I got high all night, I'd go to the homeless shelter. And it just got... This is very different from what might be like the, the image that I think most of us see when you hear... Hey, you know, I'm a male stripper. And I could be wrong, but is it... I hear a male stripper, oh, I think, hey, I'm on stage as a bunch of beautiful women no. throwing money at me, so wanting to touch me. It's not, it wasn't glorified like you see in the movies. Right. It wasn't a bunch of women. It was an open bar, meaning like men and women could come. The majority were men. And there was a lot of times where the guys wanted to do more than just put a few dollars in your underwear, right? And if you were someone that was willing to do that kind of stuff, you'd go in the back room and you'd make more money. So my angle was... So it wasn't an enjoyable, glorious time. It wasn't. And my angle was always like, I wanted to find the guy that I knew did drugs. Because that was my own... The only reason why I'm there is because of my drug addiction. So I don't want to hang out with the guy that likes my personality. Mm. I want to hang out with the guy that likes me because I can get coke. Or likes me because I like to smoke crack too. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I was like manipulative. I was strategic on selective almost. Yes, the, so- exactly. And I mm-hmm. almost like, and it just gave me the wrong opportunities, for lack of better terminology. It just gave me the wrong opportunities. I was able to meet those kind of guys. I was able to, you know what You're I mean? You're just exposed to it. I was just exposed to it. Found another guy that I was worked that did the same thing as me, that loved coke and crack as much as I did. And now we're out there. Now we're mm-hmm. out there. Hustling guys, finding new ways to make money and stuff. So it was really, really, really bad. Um, ended up back. So now, now my mental state, like I'm starting. You touched on something when you it's said. It's almost it, like it's not as bad as it, it could be right now. You know, like you're you touched on money. something when you said um, it was almost, like it makes it become normal. So to me, I'm 30 something years old. I got a. My parents are at home worried about me, wondering when I'm going to turn my life around. How old is your son at this point? My son is becoming a teenager, so now I'm starting. So now when I'm doing these hardcore drugs, I have these, like, scary thoughts. Like, my son's going to find out what I'm doing. Someone's going to tell him. Like, it's just... you didn't know at this point. No. And and there's a lot of this, a lot of this people don't know to this day. You know what I mean? So that's... I have no problem sharing it, but it's... Some people still don't know some of the details. Um, I would get mixed i would pretty much i like to put it like this instead of making things happen i would let things happen Mm -hmm. i would let life kind of take its course okay and i was okay with that you know and i was okay with not knowing whose house i was crashing at i was okay with you know the stuff that was happening um then i met a female that did the same types of drugs as me and had a full-time job and had a house okay Hmm. so as a drug addict it's that's almost a like huge, hope. It's, it's like, hope yeah, it's be, like, it's like, I, she's doing it. Yeah. yeah. But it was like, it gave me more. It was an, an, an um, what's the word I'm looking for? An she was enabling me. She okay. was, ena- an, an, right. she oh, was yeah. enabling me to continue that lifestyle. So now I have a safe, clean place to sleep every night. I have a girl to hang out with instead of guys, which is like, so, I mean, I know it sounds so crazy, but in my mind, that's what's going on. I'm like, this is a way better situation. Well, you have, than what I was you in. ultimately have the American dream. You just, it involves drugs with it. You yeah. Know, you so have a, a home, you have drug a wife, addict. you have so, a good job. It's So now I'm staying there and I'm doing all this crazy stuff. I'm inviting guys over to, to hang out and do drugs and try to make money. Um, I'm chasing drugs. Um, how does she, how does she react to her house? She doing this? She, she's also a drug addict. Oh, so if it involves drugs and money, she's, she's allow, okay. She's allowing it. Okay. So that's why it was a bad, it was a lose, lose situation. That situation escalated, um, very quickly because there was long story short, the drug use and the drug transactions got into, it, it just got out of hand. And, um, the woman upstairs ended up owing me money. I busted open the door one night. The police were involved. I had to uh, turn myself in. I mean, I was mm-hmm. so drunk and high that I couldn't, like, run from the police. 
I had to turn myself in. The only thing that saved me was that woman said, Maurice is a great guy. He actually has permission to come in and out of my apartment, just not when the door is locked. He must have been under the influence of drugs and alcohol because I know wow. he would have never done wow. this, right? So that statement... Stopped you from getting hit with that a B &E statement, right there. Exactly. That statement let the judge decide that it was going to be a B&E and not a home invasion. Wow. You're talking about a 15-year sentence. Yeah. So I would still be in jail, okay? Because this was 2009, 2010. I would still be in jail if that woman hadn't expressed that kind of um, feelings about me. So they dropped it to a and e I'd served like nine months or ten months. Um, and when I got out... What's it like? I'm, I'm sorry. But yeah, no. What's like... I'm curious about what... The, now... The, like the withdrawals while you're in prison, you're not getting coke, right? So you're it's mental drinking. withdrawals. It's all yeah. mental. So like I've had experiment, I've had experience with heroin, um, and there's a lot of physical addiction to heroin, um, and I've had experience, two bad experiences with heroin, but with cocaine, it's all mental. Heroin was never really your never my your drug problem. of choice, and okay. I was scared of needles and all that stuff. And um, we can touch on that in a minute. But with cocaine, it's all mental. Right. I'm in jail, and I'm still thinking about it. I'm still thinking about the taste of. Of sniffing How it makes you feel. Yeah, exactly. But not so, really sick or physically. Not anything. physically sick. It's all mental. Like, and then you okay. get to the point where you're like, so, and I was always, I like that you noticed that I was always self-aware. I knew that I was in a better place because I was in prison and not on the streets chasing drugs. So Absolutely. I kind of, so now I'm the guy in prison and I've got the positive attitude. I'm signing up for the extra writing class. Yeah. I, oh, they, you can take a college class here? Sign me up. Oh, you can take a reading class here? Sign me up. I'm making the most out of it. It's like a mm -hmm. free rehab. I'm hitting the weights. I don't really lift weights, but I'm hitting the weights. I'm running outside when they give me a chance. I'm doing my push-ups. I'm drinking water. I'm watching what I eat. I'm saying taking that, care of yourself. I'm taking right? care so of myself. So would you say, let me just interject really fast. Depending on your environment, I adapt. that's who you become. Yes. So it's so so important today that you yourself probably you have to surround yourself with positive, positive good people, and and it's obviously self awareness. Stay away from yes. or attempt to yes. stay away from all that. Okay, I don't want to jump ahead. No, so go no, ahead. but and so just to kind of even when I had a, so um. It, the cocaine is always a mental trigger, okay? Mm -hmm. So even having a bunch of clean time and sobriety under my belt now, if 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 I heard about guys planning to go get coke, it's like it's it's in my mind. My mind's turning. I know yeah. I can't do it, but it, it's 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 a struggle. It's, really? it's it's there. It's a battle. It's a mental battle. Still today. Um, still today. So, do you have? Are there any techniques? Any things that you do to kind of like, you know. I guess combat like, it. Com yeah, so combat those. Thank you. Combat the those triggers. The reason know. why I touched on the, on the running part when I started running in the in the program and stuff, um, when I did that last nine months in prison, I ran every day, no matter what. Even in the days that they didn't let us outside, I ran in my cell, and I told myself, "This is it." Like you have We're just to running in place, kind of. Yeah, and I was like, and I knew that I wasn't going to become like a like a fitness freak, but I knew that. That running was going to replace. That was your release. It was my escape. It's so like an anti drug. And um, there was a guy that ran around the yard and they called him Boston. Okay? This is why you're in jail. This is why I was in jail. 2010, 2011. And then, no, 2013, because it was the year that the Boston Marathon got okay. bombed, okay? Because um, we saw it on TV. Gotcha. And everybody knew that I was obsessed with running. And everybody knew that. I, I used to say, I want to run a marathon one day. I want to run a marathon one day. And I've learned so much about the sport of running. And did that ever seem like, you know, and it, did it ever seem nuts to think that everything that you've been through, you know, with the drug addiction, like when you said, I want to run a marathon, did you believe it when oh, you were saying I, it? Oh, I believed it, but I can remember like a couple of guys. Just haters. haters. Yeah. It's like, like, so someone in jail guys. was like, yeah, okay, buddy. Smoke, fuck that guy. Smoke another crack pipe, but you know what I mean? Oh, fuck that, that guy. So, what a dick. That, so what I'm saying is like, that fueled me. I remember there was a couple of naysayers when I said I want to be like, because the there was a guy that I don't know. I think his story was he ran Boston, the Boston Marathon, a bunch of times, and he was in jail for some like mortgage fraud or something like that. I don't know the details, mm -hmm. but his story he was like he was known as Mr. Boston around the yard, and and part of me it was Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> so part of me was um, I wanted to be not that guy in jail, but I wanted to be somebody that could say they completed the Boston Marathon. I had no idea of the significance of the race, 
the sport, the history, the the prestige of it. I had no idea. I was just kind of scratching the surface. I was like, I want to do it, right? So um, that I had, when I got out of prison that time, I did my first 2013. Half, 2013. Yeah. Did my first half marathon. Now my girlfriend fresh out of prison. How much training after that? Only the only training I had was just running in jail. Jesus Christ! But my Christ. girlfriend that I have today, Louisa, my girlfriend today was with Shout me. Shout out to Louisa. Yes, she was with me um, during that period of time, and she stood by me when I had to do that little bit of time in jail. She signed me up for that half marathon in Bristol, Rhode Island, knowing that I would be out of prison. Like I was getting out one weekend. The half marathon was on this following weekend. Wow. She signed me up and it gave me, like, she sent me the course map while I was in jail. I'm oh, showing yeah. my buddies. I'm like, look, this. I'm going to run this next week. So now people are like, wow, this kid's serious, right? And I said, because a half marathon is only 13 miles. And I was like, if I can do this, then I can try it. that. I said, it's, <laughs> o- it's only 13 so I like, miles? I think I just got tired. I took Hearing 20, him say it. I took 2,500 steps at work the other day. I thought I was going to pass out. Um. It was so, point nine miles. So, yeah, so that was like I got out and signed signed up for that race, went to that race not knowing what to expect. Now, mind you, I did organize sports as a kid. Right. I know what it's like to win a baseball game and have your right. buddy. That feeling, I, know yeah. what that, I know what it's right. like. I'm not like completely out of the loop. But I never competed at track. I never ran track. It's I never a very went, individual thing. Yeah, too. and I never went to a track meet. Like So, like I said, I was very naive to a lot of – what goes on in the sport and what a marathon runner is and what they go through. So I ran the half marathon and I finished at a pretty decent time. Nothing like that. You're going to um, like oh, set any finished. records. Yeah. yeah that's... But I remember, cause remember I was brand new. I didn't know what was going on. I wanted to know how I did. And someone said, Oh, you just type your number into this, into the, um, into the computer and your time will show up you on the screen. Right. So I did that. And the girl standing next to me was like, holy crap, like you did, you smashed it. You did awesome. She was like 144. Wow. And she's giving me a high five. And I remember that feeling of random people, like just the support, the mm-hmm. love, the camaraderie, the high five. And it seems like you've had that since kind of day one. Like, yeah. But now I'm getting so in a, fortunate in a positive way. So I'm yeah. like, this is awesome. So I literally am thinking, when is the next one? Yeah. When can I do this again? Now I was on a natural high from from a really, from right. running for, for an hour and a half, an hour and 44 minutes to be exact. I was on a natural high, and I'm thinking, this feels good, okay? And how old are you about this time? This is like 31, 32? Yeah, so, this is 2013. So, so 31, really, you were in your first half marathon. No, le- less. I was older than 31 because it was only five years ago. Okay. Yeah, it was only five years ago, so I was 35. So I'm right. Now. So now listen, so that was 13 miles, felt great, signed up. Now, I had a couple of little minor slip-ups over the next few months, okay? okay. What's over, a little minor? Well, I shouldn't call them minor, okay? Well, so over, you, you oh, define them. I don't over define the them. next few months, I would love to say that crossing that finish line that day right. kept me away from drugs movie. forever. This is right? real life. This it, is was, real life. it didn't. It didn't keep me away from drugs forever because the addiction is so strong, the the the... The craving for Coke and liquor was just so strong all the time, okay? Um, and crack and liquor, I should say, not just Coke. It was always so strong that it did. It pulled me back to the streets on a couple of occasions right around the end of 2004. So, so fast forward, go through 2014, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. I'm out of prison. I'm living with my girlfriend, yep. going to church on the weekends, um, doing um, running all the time, going to meetings. I'm doing the right thing, okay? But I wasn't – something told me that I could get – same thing. It's the same story on repeat. Yeah, still, something, tell, something tells me that I can one, do it one more time. Because you're doing so day. well. Right. So why can't I get you're, away? You're thinking like you, you, you've earned it. Yeah, and there's just there's and so you feel much stronger. You probably feel stronger. Like I'm, a, I'm better than I was right five years ago, and, and I'm going to be able to do this. Wake I've up and say, "Well, it that was fun." You it's know? crazy though because I don't know enough about the mind to kind of to kind of put this into words. God, you must know more about the but, mind than I do. But there was a there was like the whole like just a transaction between me and a drug dealer. I missed that. I I missed the sneaking away to go mm. make a buy. I missed the yeah. 
I remember once listening to a counselor, a drug counselor, who had been clean for like 18 years, okay? This was a guy that like literally like his wife left him, his daughter was disappointed in him. Like he just, he was, he was, had hit rock bottom. And he said, do you know what keeps me clean till this day? And he told us this story and everybody laughed at him. You know what keeps him clean? Once a week, maybe even, maybe a little less than that, maybe twice a month, he goes to a store, buys a crack pipe, buys a lighter, goes to an empty parking lot where he used to meet his dealer, pretends that he's waiting for his dealer, takes that empty crack pipe, takes one huge hit off of it, like a fake phantom just air, hit of, air. of just air, and he blows it out. And he says the fact that when he blows out that fake hit, the fact that he still has his money, he's not afraid wow. to pick up the phone if his wife calls. All of the things that you get that get sucked right away from you. As soon as, you take, a hit, as, soon as you take a hit from a crack pipe, you're done. Right. You're done. You're not answering your family. You're not being responsible with your money. Everything is second. Everything is second. Well, let me ask you. Let's come, uh, really fast. What what is that? Uh, without glorifying it, yeah. what is that feeling? Is it a marijuana high feeling? Is it a cocaine rush feeling? Is it a uh, I don't know. Is it a drunk feeling? Like it's a cocaine rush times like a million. It only lasts for like six oh, or right, seven minutes. That. It's so intense. It's it's. I, I can't so, like just everything's enhanced. Can, everything's enhanced, but it's your so... Your mental alertness, kind of? Your mental alertness, yes, but it automatically takes over your brain to, like, what am I going to do to get more of this? It's the I've done a lot wow. of drugs, and I'm not trying to glorify it, right. but it's the only drug that takes over men, that takes over your mental capacity and just, like, it, it makes you, you want more. more. You, you need more, more. You, need more. you need more. What am Jeez. I going to do to get more? Oh, you have more. Well, that's not enough. That's not enough. So, um... So, a slight... couple minor couple slip-ups. minor slip-ups... And but I was like I gotta I gotta run I gotta sign up for another well, minor so, slip ups meaning like a night you, you a night of caught. drinking and drugging right, but like going back you didn't home sell and being, a car. right you exactly went, you I didn't get to, fired from my job cool. okay um, so I have a question in this yeah. it, I'm just gonna ask it do you remember you know the the day the date or the year even the last time you used or yeah so that's one big piece of my story is, okay if you have a Different place to insert it. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't so want to mess that with. So, um, 2014. Now to back up a little bit. Um, I've had some really bad experiences with heroin, crystal meth, and, and an accidental overdose. Okay, mm -hmm. ended up in the back of an ambulance. First responders had to use Narcan to resuscitate me. Holy shit. Um, and so you've all, you've almost died. Yes. I mean, you, yeah, you can't, and it's tough to get much closer. And I don't like to sound like cliche, like oh, I saw the light, but it, I literally woke up in the back of the ambulance with like a warm light on me. They're asking me my first name. They're ask, asking me my last name. They're asking me who the president is, if I know what my address is, and stuff like that. And they're like, "Well, you're lucky, Mr. Loman. You're still here. We lost you for a few minutes." So I'm sorry. Just imagine that situation. And then you're like, Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Take but, um, me back. <laughs> so, I... Um, you're like, Donald Trump, shit, let me go. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're in 2014, and I completed my first full marathon, which is 26 miles which to us now I'm an God. I'm a I'm an average what, six miles. I'm an amateur average runner whatever you want if I can right. call myself that and just to for the people at home you guys need to know that 33 percent of us have completed a marathon well that's, um, that's good shit <laughs> if you're average I'm like a fucking waste of flesh no yeah I'm like not. a slob no, but to put it in perspective <laughs> to put it in perspective the guys that win marathons do it in like two and a half hours or better gotcha. it takes me four hours plus I just got my second ever sub four finish this year but we'll get back to that. Um, finished the marathon and that, at that point, that's when that runner's high, that kicked feeling kicked in. And I remember my mom being at the finish. My girlfriend, Louisa was at the finish and I it was been a big moment. I like, was literally on a runner's high for hours. Like I remember sitting in the back of the car going home, like, and I was like, this is, 
great. This is better than drugs. And I told myself did that over it? and over, and I did believe it. That's, I that's finally dope. got to the point in my life, and I was like, this feeling is so effing good. I can't believe I was putting a pipe in my mouth. I can't believe I let somebody put a needle in my arm. I can't believe I chased whiskey for years. I can't believe I chased lines of Coke for years. I was like... I was like, why couldn't I believe those teachers in 12th grade that was like, you can get high off life? Like, right. why didn't I believe them? So all this is going through my head. Way I'm like, more affordable too. Yeah, I'm like, I was, all this is going through my head. So A, I'm grateful that I'm alive. B, I'm grateful that I'm finishing a marathon. C, I'm grateful that I'm not in jail. I got my family. But I'm like, man, you were a loser for a long time. Like, why couldn't you get high on life before? So it was like this huge... Whatever word I'm trying to look for, but fucking moment of triumph. Yeah, like, so you know, I was like, like, "This is effing awesome. This is awesome." Right? That was after you finished the first marathon, first full marathon. So I literally took my put my body oh. through pain for for three or four hours. Okay, it wasn't painful until the last hour. Okay, because right. I can I can run for a couple of hours before it starts to hurt. Um, What's that pain like? It physical pain, and then you have mentally you stop. What's the physical pain? Do your knees hurt? Your back hurt? Your lungs legs? Hurt? Um. Maybe some cramping. I mean, everybody's different. Um, just your just, nipples bleed, or yeah, but I use Vaseline. Gotcha. I mean, I'm, I've I've learned a lot. I've done a bunch of yeah. See, he knows about the bloody I'm, nipples. Um, I ran a couple of marathons in my day. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that um, actually happens. <laughs> oh, it does because the friction of your shirt. Even if you have a high quality material, yeah. I mean, you're in the military. The even when of your you shirt, go and do yeah. like five miles, they tell you, hey man, like fuck, put a band aid, do something. Yeah, you know, it's gonna so, get chafy. Um, sorry, no problem. So. We're reliving now, our glory days over here while he's talking about so marathons. As those, as the mar, as the marathon, um, as I, I call myself a marathon, or I finished my first marathon. I'm also scratching the surface of the social media. Remember, I told you I did the Facebook right. post, talked right, about right. being sober. I always talk about the social media aspect because 2014 ish, 2014, 2015. I got introduced to Instagram. I know I'm like five years behind the curve, but I got introduced to Instagram. Oh, Which this, is just a platform. This is shedding light on me knowing you. That's that's about when I was at Alliance. Yeah. This is shedding a lot of light on when I was getting exactly. to know you. Exactly. So now, here I am, this guy that would never tell you what I was doing if I'm at some You're drug You're telling game. everybody. I'm telling everybody. I just finished a marathon. Oh, I just ran three miles. Oh, I just ran one mile. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. taking selfies. I'm putting it on. And I'm getting some likes. I'm finding other people well, that do what I do. Okay? And I'm looking. And, I, and like... So, yes, I get it. I know that people spend too much time on social media. I know you shouldn't be obsessed with how many likes you get and stuff like that. But for me at this But it's point, an outlet. Yeah, it's for outlet. me at this point in my life, not only was it an outlet for me to say, hey, my name's Maurice. I used to be a drug addict. Now I'm running marathons. Right. Not only was it an outlet for that, it was an outlet for me to receive, like, I was getting high. I was get. I was enjoying off, attention, off the attention. All right. So it was Which is a much better high. <laughs> exactly. And I joke around about it till this day. I'm like, I'm addicted to running an Instagram. It's way safer well, than is, cracking is, whiskey. Is it a joke though? It's. It might not really be a joke. It's not really a joke. But to me, but it's I would. A good thing, I know? would rather be obsessed with with social media and running than well, whiskey yeah, and crack. Let so, me ask you. What would you say to the person that says to you, you know, like, I, and I, you said this just like two minutes ago. Yeah. No, we need to do away with social media because people are, you know, they got their their faces in their phones. But for you, the experience is totally the opposite. Meaning, like, hey, I'd rather have my face in my phone than... You have to find a healthy balance. So, for example, if I go to work and I'm on my personal Instagram for four hours, then that's completely a waste of right. time. And I'm Any not extreme just, is yeah, no good. So, you have to find a balance. Um, there, there were times where I would go home... And I would spend too much time on Instagram, and I'm not spending time with my girlfriend. So that's not healthy either. Mm. Um, so you, so I do get it. And I actually, I, I, I'm always willing to, I know that I need a lot, I have a lot more to learn. Mm. And I, I'm not ignorant to the fact that it can be dangerous, okay? But in my situation, I'm, I'm running. Not in the danger it. that right. you've experienced, exactly, though. Exactly, exactly. And I want to get back it's to so the, much easier to manage. The, exactly. I want to get back to the question you had. And I, and I, and I, I say it as simple as like, I was a guy that used to trade my smartphone for drug money. I would never trade my laptop now. I, how right. would I get on Instagram? How would right. I store my photos? Like I would never trade my smartphone. You, you understand I mean? the value today. Yeah, I can't wait to upgrade it. Never mind trade. Like, but I literally, I can remember one point in my Let life. Let us know. We'll probably buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one point in my life where I went through like two Blackberries and two iPhones in less than three months. Okay, so I burned all my bridges. Sprint wouldn't give me another upgrade. T-Mobile wouldn't give me another upgrade. My girlfriend was like, "You're not borrowing my phone." Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was right. crazy. But I was, I was a drug addict, and I was 
those were my, do you know what I mean? Like yeah, it, yeah. It, when you're a drug addict, things have drug no value. value to yeah, them. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? So this is worth yeah, four this hours. Is, exactly. You know I mean? So to answer your question that you touched on before, March 12th of 2015. Okay. So I had already ran a couple of marathons. Wow. I had already promised myself I was never going to go back to drugs. Right. Okay. Well, I did. That's how bad coke, crack, and alcohol addiction was for me. So that winter of 2014 turning into 2015, had a nice place to live, had a great girlfriend, had a good job, right. okay? Started using again. I knew that it would be... I knew I didn't have another... I wasn't trying to go back to jail. You got no more chances. I didn't have like, any more chances. Like I literally had... Probably sixty dollars worth of worth of crack cocaine on me, a, a pipe, a bottle of vodka, a pack of cigarettes, another few bucks to get some fast food when the when the night was over. So I was doing. I wasn't like as a drug addict on the street. Like you're doing good. Like that's a mm -hmm. you're doing pretty. That's a pretty good night. Right. I told my something in my head just kept repeating to myself, repeating to myself, "You're better than this. You're better than this." Okay, what are you doing? Whether you believe in God or a higher power, something told me you're better than this. You were put on this earth to be more than a drug addict. Your parents put you, your parents raised you to be more than a drug addict. God put you here to be more than a drug addict. And now I'm not going to take all the credit. There were two gentlemen out on the street that night that were doing outreach. Okay. Wow. Jonathan and Richie, they, they, were, they run a project called Project Weber in Providence. And they literally travel the streets looking for guys like myself, okay, now they do everything from like a clean needle exchange, so guys that are very heavy into heroin abuse, they'd rather see you use heroin with a clean needle than mm. to spread more diseases, do you know what I mean? Right, of course. They want to stop, they, they talk about AIDS prevention, they're, they're out there on the streets doing... Any, any difference they can make, they're, right. they're trying to do. That's they good. literally were like, Maurice, are you ready? I, like, what are you doing out here? I thought you were doing good. Like, didn't you just post a picture, like, you finishing a marathon? Yeah. Like, that's kind of... I don't remember the exact conversation, yeah. but they knew they're that kind I was... kind of, like, reminded you of the progress you've made. Right, and, and they were like, do you want to get cleaned up? Do you want to come back to the, to the building and, and get a clean shirt? We'll give you, like, you can do one of the... Um, uh, a lot of times, like, those programs will offer, like, if you take a 30-minute survey, you get 30 bucks, right? Right. Now, I didn't really need the 30 bucks because I had a little bit of cash, but an extra 30 bucks would have been great. And it was all, like, so they saved me. They, the bottom line is they saved me. They gave me a chance to go. I, I think I had a bike with me, and I was like, let, well, let me, me ask. Keep... After they talked to you that night, did you end up using that night or no? Never used the drugs. I literally gave the drugs to another kid that was on the street with me that I knew would fucking, he'd make his whole night. So I gave wow. the drugs away. Did not give away the liquor because I wanted. I was. I knew that I was. Ne something told me I was never going to touch crack cocaine again. Something. Wow. Something that night told me I was never going to touch it again. I knew I didn't want to, right. because I. I was on that. I was on that line of like, you've had. You've done it. You've done it. You got rid of it for three years. Look at. Look at how far. Not for nothing. I mean, in three years, I had a van. I had a full time job. Like you know what I mean. Like it doesn't. Not everybody has the the ability to be able to put this the self back together, right. right? That's right. And and I never take that for granted. Okay. So that night, I gave away the. I threw the pipe on the ground. I gave the bags of cracks to somebody else. I remember walking to the program, finishing the not the program, but like to the building. I, I downed the bottle of vodka or something. Whatever the situation was, that's my date. That's my. So it was actually March tenth. It was March 10th because I drank that weekend. And I remember saying, I can't, give, I can't tell people my sober date is March 10th because I was still drinking. Just because I gave up the crack, I was still drinking. March 12th, the entire day of, from, from, from midnight, that was my first 24-hour period of without anything. So March 12th of 2015 We're coming was up my on four years. Yes, yeah, so I'm coming up on four years completely. Drug, alcohol. Now, cigarettes. the cigarettes, they stuck around for a little while, and I did continue to smoke oh, a little. It, yeah, and Give I did continue break. to smoke a little bit of pot, but part of me was like, you just replaced, like, weed's definitely not devastating right. like Coke. Right, right, But right. as a drug addict, I'm not a recreational weed right. smoker. I get to the point where if I don't have a $40 bag, 
then I'm going to have mood swings. If I do, and I do you know what I mean. So it was almost you're like, dependent. You're- exactly. So I was like, you can't call yourself clean and sober if you're still buying bags of weed um, every week. So I cut everything out, been clean and sober. Um, because I'm so vocal on social media, it's opened so many doors. That's how I was invited into a high school to talk to kids. Of course. That's and awesome. that's my new passion. And I don't expect people to just... So running saved me. Social media Let's saved me. Let's talk about the running for a little bit. So you ran that marathon. Yep. Now, do you know how many... Mar- so then this is four years now. Yeah. Uh, do you know how many to the number of marathons that you've ran? Oh, of course. How many? Yeah. So I've ran 26 full marathons and, 20, and 29 half marathons. 26... Marathons you ran. Dude. Yep, I just gotta check this phone call. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, so twenty six full marathons, twenty nine half marathons. My two year goal is to maybe compete in a half Ironman, which wow. would be swim, bike, run. But I mean, just to kind of um, let me just respond to this. Sorry yeah, about yeah, that. absolutely, man. It's been a little while. People probably wondering where you are. So the um, the running in the social media community, literally, I know I'm repeating myself, but it, it fuels me, it gives me opportunities, opens doors. So now, remember when I was in jail and I said I'm going to run the Boston Marathon one yeah, day? Yeah. Well, when I got out, um, I'm running these local marathons, like the... Um, the first one I did was a half marathon at Bristol, Rhode Island, Colt State Park. And now I'm learning the significance of the sport. I'm learning right. that like the, there's people that compete at a high level at these races. There's guys that used to run f- f- Division One track yeah. that have now stepped up their game and now they do distance. There's guys that um, a marathon is just a training run for them because they go do ultra marathons on the weekend. 100 so mile 100 races, miles dude. in the desert or through the mountains. So now I'm learning so much. I'm learning a that. Different breed of human. Can you believe it? There's people that do this without social media. Do you know what I mean? So now I'm like, holy shit, like this is way bigger than, but to be a part of a community, like nobody in the the running community is actively using drugs and alcohol. Right. You You know what I mean? Because it's kind of counterproductive. counterproductive. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of beer drinkers and alcohol drinkers, but people, what I'm saying is you said you need to surround yourself with the right people. Yes. So now like all my friends, um, the people that I'm influenced by on social media and stuff are people that are into fitness, into health, into sobriety. Awesome. I've found other people on social media that also used to struggle with drugs and alcohol. We share stories. Um, all of the positive feedback I get, people literally reaching out to me saying, I can't believe you talk about crack use and prostitution the way that you do. I have a brother that I think is into that kind of stuff, but I don't know how to talk to him. Yeah. Like, So someone sent me a message like that one day. And I was like, holy shit. So, like, I never want to – don't get me wrong. I, I tell this – I've told this story a few times recently. This is – we're in um, January right now. So just backtrack, like, less than two months. So yeah. right, right before Christmas time is probably November, right before Thanksgiving time. Um, and I told you money and, and, um, and having extra time on my hands has always been a trigger. Right. Okay. Um, so do things like this help? You know, like – Taking time and talking about oh, it. Oh, yeah. That's why I always have to talk about it because I'll leave here tonight and I'll be like, man, you, like what, five years ago, you weren't getting invited to talk about anything. Do you know that's what right. I mean? Yeah, like, so know, that's people... that. Um, so two months ago, I'm driving. Bills were paid on time. Had a little bit of extra money to go home with. Had two a, months ago? This was just two months ago. Okay. okay. And for one quick second because I knew that I had like a two or three hour period of time where I didn't have to, nobody was holding me accountable. My girlfriend wasn't going to ask where I was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had no work to go to, no part-time job to go to. My full-time job was done for the day. Just that little thought in my mind, I was like, what if I got a bag? What if I, but I said, no, no, you're an idiot. You're crazy. Like, what do you mean? Why are you thinking about that? Mm, Right. But the thought, the craving, literally like the taste of the cocaine going up my nose and the whiskey to chase it and the cigarette to chase that 
all of it rushed through my head. God, I feel like a scumbag for having whiskey. No, that's me. okay. But what I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, but you're not going to go buy an eight ball of Coke and ruin Jay, your life I told tonight, you that's right? That's a bad idea. So, <laughs> um, so all that stuff rushed through my head, and I was like, Maurice, you've come so far. Don't throw. It. Like, do you know what I mean? And, right, and, and, and those, honestly, those thoughts now are able to overpower. Yeah, them. and I was like, where are you going to buy it from? Like, you don't even know any more drug dealers. You know what I mean? So I was like, that kind of. It, I snapped out of it quickly, and I was like, "Thank God I have running social media." Just to backtrack a little bit, um, right around so a year and a half ago, I've been in my new place for a year. A year and a half ago, right? Well, a year ago, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving time of 2017. Okay, because we just had two, Thanksgiving 2018. Thanksgiving 2017. We were leaving our apartment and we had to get a new apartment. Something it's a long story with the landlord and everything. But it got to the point where it was a Friday afternoon and we had to pack the U-Haul. Well, I had been putting it off because in the back of my mind I want to get through the week. I want to get through my work week. I want to make I have a run streak that I take a lot of pride in where I run outside every day no matter what. Um, How many days were you at? Oh, years? Or? Uh, Even today, let's say, like in the winter? Like oh, so usually... tonight I'll do a mile to keep the streak going. Yeah. Tonight? Tonight before midnight, yeah. So I have, I'm up to 1,113 1, awesome, 1,1, days. The so fuck on are you doing January, with your day, Jay? On January, 1, what kind <laughs> of streak are you doing, bro? <laughs> so I, I got a I fucking just... Pornhub streak of like three months. <laughs> Jesus. Like my um, waistline is about 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. But um, yeah, that's so, awesome. That's inspiring. That thank very, that you, is. Thank you. It really outside, is. Outside, no matter what. So that's the so part of it is because of the jail time, the yeah. drug rehab time, the fact that when I used to be on the streets chasing drugs and alcohol, I wasn't doing anything positive on the street. Now I have the ability to go outside, and even if it's just run a mile, do you know what I mean? Like yeah, that's yeah. so I, I I use corny little taglines like. I run these streets that used to run me. Do you know what uh, I mean? No, ha no, hashtag that's back. not corny yeah, at all. Because it, it, it fuels me. It's corny, me. but I love it. It fuels me. Like, it works. I, and, 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 and part of my vision is to take that to the next level. Like, right. I want to do video vlogs of like on site where I used to do like crazy prostitution drug deals. And now I would never, to put it in perspective, I crossed the, line, the, the finish line of the Providence Marathon. That finish line is on the same street where five, six years ago, I was so lost. Like it was one of those nights. It was one of those days where I was waiting for the strip club to open because that's where I go make my money. Yeah. But during the day, I had nothing to do. I had no wow. money because I blew all my money the night before. I was lucky if I had a little bit of liquor and a little bit of cigarettes to get me through the day. I was lost. It was hot out. I was walking the streets and my pastor from my church pulled over and said, Maurice, I love you. Let me pray for you for a few minutes. Here's a bottle of water. Do you need a sandwich? Like... And that kind of stuff, one of the things that drove me to get clean was knowing that there was love out there for me if I did the right thing. Yeah, it's like, I know I have great of, parents. You, you know what I mean? Of it, man. I know I have great parents. I know that they're going to love me if I'm doing the right thing. I know I have friends that like to hang out with me, not with drugs and alcohol. I know that there's a big family and a group of friends at church that will be like, Maurice, you're back. Oh, my God. We've been thinking about you. We've been praying about Like, I know that. So part of that was like, Maurice, you need to cut the shit out. Like, mm. there's a good life out there. I, I, I compare it to like, I was in the underworld and now I'm in the... Mm. And, you, the and you made it. You, you know... And I made it. Yeah. So, um, what was I talking about? Um, and there's, there's a lot to be said about that because mm -hmm. even when you're talking about something about, let's say... Uh, diet, right? Like yep. a lot of people struggle with their weight and et cetera. And it's, it's on a much, I don't want to say lesser scale, but I want to say a different, it's a different scale. It's a different capacity. And you yourself have shown and have proven that you can conquer the self. You can, you know, maybe not fully, but enough, enough. to get you, you know, out of the hole or whatever and into a re whole different a place different path. of achievement and accomplishment and good feeling. and Yeah, so one of the new things I'm hooked on is learning from like these motivational guys, like someone like David Goggins, yeah. who talks, oh, yeah. about, who oh, talks about mastering God. the mind. Okay? Goggins is a freak, So now, man. you touched on the Pornhub thing. I'm, I used to be a pornography oh, addict, shit, okay? <laughs> I, I'm a pornography addict, so Cue my idiot I jokes. can't, <laughs> joke I can't be a... Someone that's trying to grow as a Christian or someone that's trying to grow as... And still a, do those things. Right. I can't be a better boyfriend if I have a Pornhub app on my phone. Right. I can't not think about cocaine and sex 
if I'm watching Pornhub on the weekends, right? That's that's very brave. That's so uh, it's like you know. So I can't have the app on my phone because I not because I don't want it because I I can't have that in my life because right. if I start, into too many if I start watching a little bit of porn, I'm going to be like, well, where's the cigarettes and coke? Right. That's where my mind and is at. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I and if I have a They're couple like of triggers, almost. yeah, I can't have a beer because then I'm like, where's the cigarettes and coke? You and that's I mean? it, that's exactly all, like the guy or girl fighting the the dietary thing. You know, they can't have if if you're watching what you eat, you cannot have a hamburger. You no, can't you have can't. one. You can't. Because one turns you into can't two. Have one piece of cheesecake. Yes. If you're trying to stay away from sweets because right. it, you know you. Shit. I know, but it's um, the fact that I was able, and I never take it for granted that I made it out. Right. Okay, I have a couple of examples right now in my life of close friends that have also decided to give up drugs and alcohol, but they're just not the same individual. Have you um, had close friends that did not make it? I'm sure. Sh- yes. Yeah, so. Over the years, so there's actually been more than five people from that men's program that I talk about that have passed away. That's geez, unfortunate. Over the last six or seven years, all from drugs or alcohol. Oh, when you think about it, man, if you don't take the path that you took and, and make changes, man, what are the options? Jail or Jail death? Jail or death. So you know, like I said, really how close other... was I to a 15-year prison sentence? Now, how close were you to death? death? How close was I to death? So how... What are your options when you get out of jail after 15 years? You know what I mean? Like right. when I got out of jail, it was nine months. And I like, I felt like I was on top of the world. I'm clean. I'm sober. I read a couple of books. I was studying the Bible. I did my push ups. Like I'm ready to rock. So today like, you have your own business now. Yeah. So I mean, a little, not really my own business, but huh? I mean, I have two, two you're great a key, You're a key player in this business. So what I have a great opportunity at Jane on Marketing to be a product and branding specialist. I'm That's literally awesome. on the phone and on social media talking to my friends about custom apparel and and promotional items and i mean obviously i like to talk so, yeah and i so i love to what promote. is it again J and R. J and R marketing of course J&R we're going to plug them up and R marketing <laughs> we're on 687 park <laughs> Avenue, cranston i can do everything from custom apparel promotional items so um and we have a digital, swag like this yeah, swag, shirts, custom swag. and why would you trust shirts. somebody that's not plugged into the fashion world with your custom apparel that's the way that's i like right. to look at it you're going to trust some old embroidery guy that's out of the loop right. or you're going to trust somebody that puts their own logo on a polo sport shirt you know what i mean so I put the panda on the polo. I like to say that. <laughs> um, so to touch on that, I when I started the running thing, I took the role of being like a cheerleader, okay? I never shut up. Right. You know, man, not just because we're recording a podcast. I never shut up. I, I'm uh, always to... talking whether it's about... Oh, these are, we're not recording yet. Oh, okay. So I... <laughs> we, we haven't started yet. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um I'm always talking whether yeah, it's about yeah, yeah. myself or about my story or, or, or stuff like that or why you should listen to me. You know what I mean? So um, it's a great opportunity for me to do something that I love. Um, and I also have a part-time job at a fitness studio called Cycle Bar Providence. They've given me a ton of opportunity. So since I got laid off from Alliance, so I have to shout out Alliance because to. Alliance hired me. Who says anything bad about now, Alliance? Now listen, they, they played such a huge role in my sobriety that it would be crazy for me not to give them wow. credit for the and rest this, of my this life. This was when I first like met you, really. So listen, please. Sorry to, to, I didn't mean no, to no, 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 like no. Go, man. This is you. So... Got clean in March of 2015. Right. The construction gig wasn't the gig for me. It no. was like, it was, it didn't give me enough. You got to shine, man. Right. You got to fucking it shine. It gave me a good wage. It allowed me to pay my bills on time, but it didn't fulfill anything inside of mm. me, right? My girlfriend at the time was like, listen, if, you, if you're if you going to be working construction and being miserable and buying a bottle and hiding it under the couch all weekend, like, that's not going to work, okay? Mm. She was like, you need to find something that makes you happy enough right. where you're not hiding a bottle of vodka under the couch every right. And that's what was happening. I wasn't... Super, super important text messages over there, I guess. That's all right. <laughs> um, I wasn't happy with work, and I was looking for other things to make me happy. I wanted a shirt and tie job. I wanted that sales job back. Now that I know that I'm not going to yeah. pick up drugs and alcohol, I know I can be successful in that sales role. The Lions is perfect for giving you the shirt and tie, tie job, but so, still the fucking energy of so yes. hustling, man. So listen to this. I had I was literally clean and sober because I told you I had a couple slip-ups. Yeah. Just of, real quick. Yeah. For anybody that doesn't know, uh, when we say Alliance, what we're referring to is uh, it's Alliance Security. They're a home security company, but... The foundation of that company is a, a really, you know, 
energetic boiler room type of, of sale oh, yes. energy. Yes. So that's why when we're making these it's like references. Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. Wolf of Wall Street, you know. Like, yeah. So now you have something to kind of paint a picture, but go ahead. And I'm so. going gonna, gonna to continue to paint that picture. So I went, um, I told you my girlfriend gave me the kick in the butt motivation. She was like, if you're not happy with the construction job, go find something that makes you happy. Yeah. I literally went to, I think, the Salvation Army on the east side of Providence and got the best looking shirt and tie combo I could find. Threw it on, mm. f- felt like a million bucks. Went to the job fair at um, at Crown Plaza Hotel. Found um, I was looking for a car sales job because I love cars, and the only thing that used to mess with my success in the car business before was my drug addiction. Right. So now I'm thinking, get I'm, back I'm in it, maybe. So let me get back in it. But then I see this booth, Alliance Security, right? And I see these two hustlers. Who's I, there? Um, John. John Op oh, and and, oh, and, Op. and um and, and Sully, right? So Oof, and, and there's Chelsea, not more energy right? in the and, room than those so, two knuckleheads. So they um they were like, What's up? Come over here, come over here. They're like, We got a good thing going. You know, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's telephone sales, but we got guys making a thousand dollars a week, right? And I one of the things I said was I got a, I got a record and they were like, Well, you know, we're gonna give you a shot. Welcome to the club. Right. Well, exactly. we used to joke around in the mortgage Welcome business. The if you don't have a record, then why are you working? Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, come on, like <laughs> like I got a record, they're like, Great, what's your social? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but whatever. Um, they were like, We're gonna give you a shot. They said if you have that because t- I, I was hyped up to be there. Yeah. I'm shaking the hand like my name's Maurice. I'm mm-hmm. right. So they were like, if you come in tomorrow dressed like that, with that attitude, yep. we're gonna give you a shot. So now I remember, let me paint this picture. Had my beat up Buick. I remember leaving early, getting my coffee, had another new shirt and tie combo. How old are you at the... This, is this was five years five ago. Five years ago, okay, years, great. Right? 35, 36. 35, right? So new shot at life, remember? Yeah. I'm clean, I'm sober, I've got a couple marathons under my belt, got a great girlfriend that's supporting me when I'm yeah. doing the great things, right? The norm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the you, the you. <laughs> so I walk into this... I, I drive to this job interview, and I remember thinking, now mind you, throughout my years, I've worked everywhere. I've yeah. done Burger King. I was a paper boy. I did the, you know what I mean? I've been, had, I've been the, around. had the Citizens Bank job. I had the mortgage jobs. I've swept floors. I've cleaned bathrooms. I've done it, right? So when I pull up to the job interview, I see an empty building, and it says office space for lease, and I'm like, oh, here we oh, go. Fresh it's going to be some, it's going to be some fly-by-night company with a couple of phones and a couple of desks. I was like, I'm not that excited. But then the navigation tells me that I have like 500 yards to go. So I'm at the wrong building, okay? I drive to the next building, and what do I see? A Bentley, a Beamer, (laughs) and a Ferrari. And I'm like, this is where I want to work. I'm not even in the building yet, okay? I'm I'm like, what's going on here, right? So I walk in the building, and I'm not kidding, all right? This guy's spinning the wheel. For a cash prize, there's <laughs> guys dwarfs. on the phones. Throwing there's doors. guys in there's guys in two thousand dollar suits. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah, I'm like, right, this yeah. is boiler room. This is right, like, this right. is it. And they 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 take me to the to the office. They sit me down. They tell me what they do there. They're like, listen, it's easy. We give you a script. You got to have a positive mental attitude. Is the number one rule, yeah, right? For sure, for so sure. they give me these. And you're good there. It never seemed like your attitude was an issue. So, but I was so pumped up. So I was so pumped up. I was like, tell me when to start. Tell me when to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They hire me. I am not exaggerating. Now, I know it's not like, you know, record-breaking money, but they gave me the opportunity to make $1,000 a week. Yeah. Now, that's two weeks worth of work at the construction site. Yeah. Okay? So I'm literally changing my financial situation overnight. I have money coming in. We're paying our bills on time. I'm feeling awesome. I upgraded from the beat up Buick. Alliance did so much. Not only was the money great, the fact that I had a place to go every day to get that excited, I never thought about drugs and alcohol. Don't get me wrong. I'm still a recovering addict. There was... So there was some guys there people, that did some yeah, partying sure, and stuff, sure. you know what I mean? But I always, you know what I mean? That's guys crazy, knew yeah. I was that guy that was the clean and sober guy. Yeah. So you're not going to come and say, hey, Mo, do you want to go do coke tonight? That's good that people respected I, that. People yeah. respected it because I stayed vocal about it. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I don't do that stuff. You know what I mean? And, and I was just so hungry for the money and the opportunity that they gave me something to go to every day and something to be excited about. So I owe a lot of the beginning of my sobriety to them because I would have never stayed clean and sober if I didn't have that excitement to go to every day. So not only did they, they provide a foundation for my sobriety, I got promoted. They let me travel. I ran a race for them in Las Vegas. What did you get promoted to? Um, 
to hiring the telemarketers. Like recruiting. So, so I was recruiting the telemarketers. That's kind of when, uh, yeah. well, I was there. I, you know, that's really, I think uh, when I started there, you know, one of my second stints there, I believe that's, yep. I think you were already in that role. And I was telling Jay before you got here that I, we never really knew each other too well. We didn't interact right. much. But he'll tell you, what did I say? Like, I didn't know him too well, but every time I interacted with him, how did I leave? Oh, smiling, laughing, kind of. So no matter what it was, man, whether it was a, hey, what's up in the hallway, or just, uh, you know, like, hey, go check with Maurice on this, whatever the yeah, case yeah, yeah. was. Anytime I, I left, you know, an interaction with you, man, I was in a better mood than I was when I got there. I appreciate you saying that. But it gave me the opportunity to kind of showcase my gratitude, okay? Mm-hmm. Here's a guy... I was positive when I was waking up in the ACI because I was clean and I was sober and I wasn't waking mm. up with bed bug bites at a homeless shelter, okay? I'm, I got a clean bed. I don't have to pay rent. I'm stress-free. I got three meals today. Like, you know what I mean? I'm always right, looking right. at the positive side that's of good. things, right. right? So now that I have a shirt and tie job, that's what I like to call it, yeah. I have the ability and the opportunity to make which is pretty good money, $1,000 yeah. a week. I mean, that's awesome money. I'm not making that now, so you guys better buy some sweatshirts from me, yeah. right? So, um, <laughs> 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 but, um... What I'm saying is it was easy for me to be excited, positive, and grateful because awesome. here I am, the guy that used to be on the streets chasing drugs, used to be in jail, used to be in drug rehabs, used to be in halfway houses. Now I got this job. You're on the my, other side. My boss mm-hmm. drives a Ferrari. The license plate says earned. I'm like, the sky is the fucking limit. Like <laughs> yeah. this, this is the, like it gave me so much hope, drive and, drive and hope and-, and, and vision and everything. And they supported it. They were like... We love your story. Yeah. We love the fact that you're amped up every day. We love your positivity. Why don't you be the guy that hires the guys that make the phone? Like, you know what I mean? Like, right, so right. it was yeah, like, you kind of fit right in that yeah, role. Yeah. And they, and I rolled with it and they gave me so much opportunity. I got laid off. And I say this and I don't say it lightly. When I got laid off, I was super bitter. I was super upset because the company downsized twice. I wasn't affected. Um, and then when I got laid off, I was very bitter. However, I said, you would be the biggest hypocrite in the world if you did not continue to be Mr. Positivity. Right. Right. You got laid off. You you didn't get fired. You didn't get shot. You didn't go to jail. Nobody in your family died. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you got laid off. Deal with it. You know what I mean? So, yes, I was bitter, and it took a level of mature. Like, I had to grow into a little next level of maturity mm-hmm. to kind of handle it the right way. And I put a nice professional thank you post online and everything. I was never going to do anything other than right. that. I was never going to blast them and say anything bad right, right. because they did so much for me. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it showed me that a positive mental attitude, what they drill in your head, it really is the first key to success because I still continue to wake up, and I'm like, Life doesn't suck. Like, I used to wake up and say, life sucks. Right. Why did life suck? Because I blew all my money on Coke the night before. Because I'm looking for cigarettes in a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. Right. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's why my life sucked. Life doesn't suck now just because I got laid off from my job. Right. I can collect unemployment and go look for another job. I can put on my resume that I just got promoted twice in three years. Do you know just what I find mean? find a way to look for the so positive. So I was always staying positive. Um, and then when... And it gave me a lot more time to focus on my Instagram and my run streak, Fine. right? Yeah, so yeah. now I'm now I'm going crazy with the that run streak. Is yeah, fucking impressive. That's beast, man. Dude. So I do. So now I'm. So what so, have I done for a thousand days straight aside from eat and shit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I fucking shit for a thousand days straight. Crazy. So I took that as an opportunity. And now I now so now I was just learning. I'm learning more about yeah. about the social media and how people use it as a tool to kind of like a platform to tell their story. Yeah. And I find guys online like Gary Vee that are like, "You're stupid if you're not telling your story." Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like your story, the, is the, the, your power is in your story. So I keep talking about it, and I'm like, "Yes, I'm that guy that's like, look at me." I'm drug free. Yes. I used to be on the streets smoking crack. So right. it can be done. So it doesn't not everybody's problem is addiction. Right. It could be it could be mm-hmm. depression. It could be a, um maybe they're mistreating their wife, maybe whatever the situation is like you're, you you're can, like a beacon of hope, man. Like, I, I want to be that. I change, want you know? I, if like, I can, can do it, okay? Can grow if I can, can do it from then there, you can do it. Yeah. And it and it's like if you don't like where you are, the, the pastor that I talked about that that um there's two pastors that were, that made that had contributions to my sobriety, but the one that I talk about, his line is where you are now. And the shout out to Pastor Allen at Praise Tabernacle Church. He says where you are now is not where you always have to be. That's right. So if you don't like it, you know what I mean. There's change plenty, it. Change it. 
Change yeah. it. If you don't like that's your job. That's what we're doing with this podcast. Yeah, we're not. Like, and <laughs> yeah. I'm not so, so for everybody out there listening, hopefully there's going to be a million people listening by next year. Uh, uh, probably like 600K. All right. right I like that. I like that. Um, <laughs> I'm getting there. If you don't like where you are, and, and I know I'm not the first one to say stuff like this, but just change get up. Yeah. Get up and change it. You You're not a tree. Now, obviously, yeah. obviously, you can't yeah. walk out of your job if you have two kids at home, depending on your That's paycheck. Right. But you can all stop about, looking for another job. All of our listeners job. quit their jobs yeah. right now. But all no. six of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can find another one. You can yeah, do a yeah. side hustle. If you're passionate about painting, start painting and stop thinking about it. Like, yeah, right. So just do it. Just do it. And I'm living proof that you can do something you love and make something out love of it. it. So yeah. I love running. I love talking. I love social media. And I'm using it. People, That's awesome, man. I mean, um, and I never want to sound like I'm patting myself on the back or anything. You should, no, but it's, it's opened so many doors. Like, yeah. I had an old friend that I went to high school with. She sent me a message on Facebook. She was like, oh, my God, I just saw that you spoke at a school last year. Do you, would you be interested in coming to speak to my students? And I said, of course I would. Yeah. And, and, I ha- and that's where my passion is, to touch on that again, because when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, that's probably when I you was needed it so most. impressionable. And mm. the people that were telling me marijuana is a gateway drug were the people that I thought had no idea. And I don't, I'm trying to say this the right way without, I don't, I never want to come across as like arrogant or anything, but these kids, they fucking believe me. When I'm yeah. up there talking to them, they can relate to me whether. Well, how can you not? I mean, they, you have more experience. That's what them. I mean. I've been there. You, I've you done that. You know more than most people that can read and yes. see whatever they so want to. So it's like, you, I you want them it. to know, I want them to know that drugs are not the answer. You can get high right. off of life. You can get high off of hanging out with your boy and, and recording a podcast. If you think you're a good basketball player, you better go practice because there's 10 kids Damn. that are practicing more than you right now and they're not smoking weed on the weekends to hold them back like that's, that's right. what i want to tell them if you think you're a rapper Go guess rap. what the guys that are rapping and that they're are successful, putting in work they're putting in work okay they're not smoking it up every weekend waiting for someone to come knock on the door and say hey right. i heard you could spit hot bars that's not the way it works right the smoking the drugs and the alcohol is all for part of the entertainment okay that's right it comes along with it but the stuff it's so hindering and in my opinion marijuana at a young age does suck away like ambition drive motivation and all that stuff i'm not educated enough to have like a, a, a an intelligent debate about You're it speaking as, on experience i'm so. speaking on experience right. to me marijuana was never enough by 18 right. i was putting coke in my blunts and people and when you say remember you asked it, i i have a friend today who said something very very short very sweet and very real he said i remember when i heard that you were putting coke in your blunts that's when i stopped hanging out with you Wow. You, it's yeah. tough because you can't really fault him for that. How can I fault him you for can't. that? I appreciate the honesty right now. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I wonder how many more of my friends Thought stopped that or, hanging out with me because right. they heard I was doing the coke. Yeah. They heard I was putting coke in my blunts and not, right. you know what I mean? And it's like, I appreciate that kind of honesty. You know what I mean? There's some people to this day that probably are like, oh, there's Maurice. Big deal. He's clean for a few years. You know what I mean? Big deal. Let's take away everything (laughs) from your story. How about here's Maurice who's ran fucking 25, 26 marathons. 26, yeah. Fuck everything else. (laughs) That's a big deal in itself. The fact that you... you you did that, not even after you got clean, but like while you were still dealing with that. You know, that's that's fucking... And it's... And another thing. I'm able to do these things. So... I am able to get up, go outside, and run a mile and record it on Instagram. So I like you pumped. said, you're going to do it tonight. I'm going to do it tonight. So I'm pumped up about it. So why wouldn't I do it? Like it's like. <laughs> crazy. So when you record this, do you, do you share these videos? If you go and run a mile tonight, do you share it anywhere? Yeah, so I'll make a post and I'll because uh, I, right. I, I send I, me that link because I want to put that link on this. Uh, oh, I will. You know, so when I'm we not, share this link. I want, I want everybody to watch Panda Maurice. So marathon Panda, Panda Maurice. Maurice. So, the, yeah, so if you're listening, make sure you check out that link of him running a marathon. Yeah. You know, after oh, sitting here with us for a few hours. Marathon Panda. Maurice. There you go. Uh, and I have a second Instagram page called More with Maurice, and that's my sales that's awesome. and marketing oh, page. M O R E. M A U R I C E. Because it took me a long time to oh, build my community. Name. How do you spell more with more M O R E? M O R E. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so more with Maurice. Yeah. Gotcha. Um it took me a long time to build the community that I have on Instagram. And I used to and I and I take Do you have a lot of followers? Do you have a I mean I have a good amount. <laughs> Because um, we want them. <laughs> Do you oh, have no, a lot of followers? Yeah, I'm going to shock you guys out. I'm sorry. I wasn't even thinking that. I'm like over there. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really Where trying. I'm going with this is I never wanted to be that guy that's like, <coughs> hey, you know, buy my protein shake. Yeah. Hey, like, you know, take this shake because it made me lose 10. Like, I, I'm, I'm so against that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't want to... 
I'm trying to put it in the right words, but I want everything about me to be genuine and organic. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. The reason you don't want to come across salesy and like you're of, trying to. One of the best compliments I've gotten um, on this new journey was I was running the Providence Marathon last year. There was a gentleman um, that was in from Atlanta, um, and he was he was running the race, and he saw me, and he goes, aren't you Marathon Panda Maurice? I follow oh, you. Shit. He said, I follow you on Instagram, right? And I said, yeah, and he goes, he goes, can I, um, and I said, good morning, high fives, positive vibes, great job getting out here, we're about to eat 26 miles for breakfast, let's go, <laughs> what did you wake up for? Like, I'm pumped, I'm yelling all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, holy shit. He goes, you're the same way you are on Instagram. Like, this is real and life. I'm like, yeah, of course I would be like, wait, wait, wait. So, but it, it put things That's in perspective. And that, so now it's almost like, and I try to come up with these like, Little, there's a little bit of arrogance in them. I come up I'm with sure, these, yeah. I come up with these hashtags like always working, never posing. Because yeah. if I put on workout clothes, I'm going to work out. Yeah. I'm not going to go to a photo shoot and, right. and, and say I work. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and believe me, there's people that their That's fitness awesome. level and their running um, um, capabilities just far exceed mine. Fuck it, I'm just matter. grateful. For what you're able, doing. For what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm grateful that like. The running gave me an outlet to share my story. Absolutely. That I'm accepted by the community. There's guys out there that could dust me in any distance, and they're still willing to give me a high five. I've had guys come up to me after a race and be like, bro, your energy is contagious. Thank you for the high five at the end. Like, I was struggling. And nice. that feeds me, all right? Yeah, Here's a guy that finished the race because an of hour that, before man. me, and he's and he's telling me that he, he remembers my high five at, at mile seven. Wow. Or he remembers me screaming, great job, or this is what you woke up for. You know what I mean? And it's that kind of stuff. Um, and I know I'm not the only one out there. I just read an article yeah. in a Runner's World magazine um, about that random guy at the race that gives you a high five. That random guy that gives is you that a pat on the back. That's me. I mean, the article wasn't about me. But yeah, what I'm saying you. is You're I guy. take, That's awesome. I love that role. I love it because I'm not going to win one. I'm not going to win a marathon, okay? Unless there's like only three other runners and they're all slower than me. And they're us. But, <laughs> and they're us. <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm not going to win one, so why not have fun? Why not use... Let me ask you, is your goal to win one? My goal is to just become better. Yeah, because I feel it. Yeah. If, if your goal was to win one, you'd take the steps to get there. Right. If your goal is to get better, then My you goal just is to better. get better. And I shouldn't say never. I mean, there's Could add, you know. there's opportunities to like win your yeah. age group. Yeah, it just doesn't um, sound like that's your mindset right now. Right. And, and that's just, a whole other aspect to this story because now you're 40 and, you know, not saying that that's old, but it's not, it's not 22. Correct. Because so, it's not, motherfucker. No, no, but look, <laughs> I'm I'm that ass down. Down. Hashtag fresh and 40. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I'm in a different age bracket, but yeah. there's still some fast motherfuckers. Yeah, I'm sure. Because yeah, you've got guys sure. that are former military. Yeah. You've got, guy, like, you got guys that their fitness and their strength are just at the next level. Right. So yeah. I don't do a lot of, like, weight training and stuff. Right. So before this calendar year is over... One of my goals is to incorporate a consistent weight training, strength conditioning that's awesome. program, that's awesome. just to get better all around, because that's only going to help me be a right, better right. runner. Sure. Um, I want to take swim lessons so I can do a triathlon. That's dope. I That'll want, help your breathing and all I that. I want to be an Iron Man and not just a marathon panda. I want to be the Iron Panda. The Iron um, Panda. I want. I want to take my public speaking to the next, next level. level. I want to sit down with people that have formal educations. I want them to give me their honest feedback. I want them to say, don't ever say that again, but what you said right there. You that's know, awesome. That's what I want, okay? Yeah. And I've, 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 I've taken steps. I'm involved with a local drug prevention coalition. Once again, when people see how passionate I am, when people say, like Excuse I say me. things like, no more back of ambulances, I've been given this second chance. And I get hyped up about that because it's true. Like, why shouldn't I be a light? Why shouldn't I be telling kids not to do drugs when I made it out? That's right. Do you know what I mean? I wish I had. No, You've seen I, the darkest of, yeah. you know, like, you, you told me some things just here tonight, man, that I couldn't imagine. You know what I mean? Like, that's, it's, you put a real raw vision of what this could lead to, you know, like these, uh, these bad decisions, you know, yes. they're, they're not just like a, hey, you're going to spend a weekend in jail or you're going to get a DUI driving. Like, no, there's there's real fucking consequences to this shit, man. And it could and be a lifetime. It could be like, you know, yeah. over a spread of 15 years. Well, it was. It yeah. was. And it, so, it, so it that's was. another thing. I could wake up, and I say this often, I could wake up tomorrow morning and I could say, Maurice, 
you have a son that you haven't seen in years. You haven't always been a good father to the to the son that you are a part of his life. You don't own a house. Um, your credit's not that good. You don't. You haven't been able. Like, do you know what I mean? I could right. focus on all of the things I don't have, yeah. or and, or I could focus on the fact that I'm alive. I'm healthy. I have two jobs, and I have every fucking opportunity in the world to better myself. That's the J Squared podcast. I've been on the J Two J Squared podcast. <laughs> That's right. I mean, that, so it's like things things couldn't be better. So I always focus on the positive. That's awesome. There's so much. There's so much yeah, to focus. It's what on. you can control. But I mean, I know I've been like super long winded. Was there Bro, things this, that? This this has been incredible, man. I mean, yeah, it's it's been a little bit, but none of it was, you know, forced. This was, I think, it was a great conversation. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I appreciate you for yeah, it. And I'm, absolutely, it's great I'm like to hear your story. I'm like dude, a poster you know? boy for all the bad things, and you can get rid of them. So, drugs, alcohol, <laughs> prostitution, <laughs> pornography, all you of it. You don't, don't need them now, but you, you don't know, need them. Don't try them. You're a, you're a poster boy, I think, for for. Uh, the human spirit, man, and just being able to overcome it. Like, it could be, like you said, you know, you could be dealing with something as simple as, hey, man, I don't treat my wife as good as I want to. You know, like, maybe, am I always going to be like this? Am I always going to be a scumbag? Or, you know, I drink too much. Am I always going to be, like, you're living proof, man, that no matter how bad you think it might be, like, you can fucking change, man. You can you work can. at it and you can change. And even if you slip up, that's not the end, you know? Like, don't kill yourself over it, you know? Don't beat yourself up. Don't think that... Hey, it's over. Like I'm not cut out for this. Just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, and get over it. You know, like work and out there's of it. always a way out. There's always, yeah. there's always, there is always a way out. You and there's always someone that's been through it before. Um, right, right. Like I mean, there's so much more that I I, I have to learn. I want to read more. I want to get. More. I want to further my education. I want to yeah. be a more polished public speaker. Be more educated, so I can so I can be more impactful when I get in front of. If that's I get an that's amazing, man. Yeah, so it's it's very inspirational. All very, right, very so inspirational. It has been, man, and we'll definitely we, we got to do this again sometime. This is a lot of fun, Thanks for letting for me sure. talk for yeah, so long. Absolutely, I know, man. I know, no, I know, you, man. <laughs> you guys um, rock. Before before we wrap this up, though, I just want to touch touch on a couple of things where everybody can find you again. Um, first thing though, it's J and J and oh, R so, marketing. Yeah. So J and R marketing is my number one priority right now. That's my full time job. I'm a sales and marketing product branding specialist, whatever label you want to put so on. That it. means if you need a logo on some shirts, you need a logo on some Anything. pop sockets. I Anything. saw the special on pop sockets. Consulting. That's a deal. Consulting. So we have a graphic design team full time that's gonna um, that can do branding and logo design. Yeah. If you have your own idea or design, we can put it on anything. We can put it on pop Car sockets magnets. for cell phones. Car magnets, Oof. silicone cell phone wallets, whatever anything you, you can think of. Good um, shit. So just one stop shop for getting your name out there and exposure. Correct. I like to call company. it fresh and visible. If you want to stay fresh and you want like to be it. visible, then you then you contact me. Um, also, shout out to Cycle Bar Providence, my other part time job. Cycle Bar Providence, what's that? Premium indoor cycling. So forty five forty five spin bikes with music, lights, Sweet. and very oh, high class. Oh, uh, nice. So like a like a fucking spin class on steroids. Correct. Correct. Yoked up. Yeah. All right, and then it's more with Maurice. What's the two Instagram pages? Two Instagram pages. Number one is Marathon Panda Maurice. Okay, and then it's the awesome. second one is more with Maurice. Nice. Okay. All right, um, everybody, check them out. You know, like make sure you give that a shot. We're gonna get that video. Uh, if you do that video, I mean, he's, oh yeah, yeah, I'm he's gonna, gonna run that out. We're gonna take a still <laughs> picture tonight. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Let's get that link up. up. Absolutely. And, um, you guys rock. Nah, you're awesome, man. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening, everybody. I think we're good to go. Good Absolutely. To go. Yep. Love, peace, and hair grease. <laughs> that was dope shit, man. That was, man. That was, that was awesome. That was, that was awesome. Uh,